live to the UK. UK. News, information, entertainment, and the best music from the past 40 years. This is Play 2 UK. Tommy Boyd. Call 01243 556060. Email studio at playradiouk.com. Skype play.radio.uk. Now, live from the south coast of England, The Tommy Boyd Show, only on Play 2 UK. Good evening in the UK, good day uh, around the world. Hello if you're podcasting this, it's Tommy here uh, with Fiona. Good evening, Fiona. Good evening, how are you? Catherine Cat will be along later. She is our arts and tarts and Christmas shopping. I've got an email already as we were listening to the intro uh, from Steve, Stephen Robert, Steve Robert. Thanks for that, Steve. Amongst other things, very flattering about the Arts and Tarts show. He suggests we call Catherine. Catherine will be with us from around about 10 o'clock. She certainly will. And Catherine is a professional full-time sex worker uh, who exotically, her, her home is her office. She has one of the rooms in her mansion done out as a dungeon. Fantastic. And whenever possible, she broadcasts to us and you, good listener, from her dungeon, talking about the world of arts because she is something of an aficionado, a connoisseur. She likes the arts, opera, high art, Japanese film, the novels of Henry James. She's also quite happy to review the latest thing on television. And she also reviewed when she went to Gordon Ramsay's restaurant, or one of his restaurants, she went there because one of her clients was taking her for an anniversary lunch. It was 160 quid a head. Give you some idea, good listener, of the kind of life you might have led if you had gone down that um, <laughs> delightful, if sticky road. But that's what Catherine Cat does for a living, a professional sex worker. Uh, she's quite happy to be called a hooker or a tart, which is what she does. Uh, but she also represents people in the sex industry, so she's um, <clears throat> she's got some clout. <laughs> some of her clients, no doubt, are drawn to. Anywho, that's from around about 10 o'clock. One of the things that we're going to be talking about today, gentle listener, is conspiracy theories. And the reason for it is, A, because everybody's very interested in them, but B, and this should be A, really, but I've done A, and nothing comes before A, so I can't go back and put this reason before A, having made A the fact that everybody's interested in them. Because there is a reason that's more important than that. But it's got to be B. Okay. This is a bastard of, of alphabet and consecutive things. No. Freud says that the reason we don't remember our dreams is because the action isn't consecutive. He says that in life, action is consecutive, and so we can remember things because they come in an order. Mm -hmm. That follows that follows that. Yeah. And there's a certain logic to that. But in dreams, there's no logic. No. He says none of us could remember the 26 letters of the alphabet if somebody hadn't placed them in order. And who says they have to be in order? Mm. They don't, do they? They're 26 totally random separate items. But somebody put them in order and decided that A was first. Mm. And, and if you don't stop and think about it, you think, well, that's, it has to be like that because A obviously comes before B. And Z naturally comes last. That's totally random, isn't it? Yeah, because they do say that you can um, usually only remember seven consecutive items, but with that, well, that's off. <laughs> You're looking at me like that. Now, I'll tell but you that's... what you couldn't do. You couldn't... You, okay, right now. <laughs> not in any order, Fiona right. Stutton. Give me the 26 letters of the alphabet. N in no order. You're not allowed to do any that follow each other, right? Starting with, go. Okay. Yes. Um uh, X. X. Um, M. M. P. P. A. A. D. D, that's good. T. T. S. S, that's very good. Um, W. W. I'm reckon, I'm gonna reckon you're gonna get 18 and then L. you'll be totally stuck. L. Have I said N? <laughs> no, you haven't said N there. Oh, it's like hangman. Um, yeah. B. B. G. G. J. J. Q. Q. E. E, you're doing well. Uh, why? I said why. No. Um, V. V. C. <laughs> C, yeah. <laughs> I might be duplicating. Does it matter if I duplicate? You've does done it, 18, which is pretty good. Does it matter if I duplicate? Uh, I said S. Y y yeah, you have. So I'm not going to let you go much further. Oh, okay. Because you don't know, do you? Well, I don't know what. Well, you don't know which ones you've done and which ones you, have, ones you haven't. No, exactly. Because it's con because you can't. Nobody can do the alphabet except consecutively. 
And that's why, when I say that there is a more important reason why we should be discussing conspiracies tonight than the fact that everybody's interested in them, <laughs> but having called that A, mm -hmm. I can't now promote anything before that, <laughs> which is what I want to do. I could make it one, and therefore <laughs> my previous reason it will be become 1B. <laughs> What about in reverse order? <laughs> <laughs> no, the re the more the more imp a question for Catherine. Paul Hemmings has uh, Paul of Farringdon has a question for Har Harring uh, Harringdon Farringdon <laughs> for, for Catherine. He's emailed in. Good evening to you, Paul. Thank you for this. Our email address. I'll remind you in just a second. He says, "Would you rather go to heaven for the weather or hell for the company?" Is a very good question, isn't it? <laughs> I don't want to go to heaven because all the people I've come across who are likely to end up in heaven are so boring. All the people who come up to you at parties with a little crucifix <laughs> on their thing. Oh, God, they're tedious. <laughs> my three-year-old boy said to me on Sunday... <laughs> well, actually, my five-year-old boy said to me on Sunday, Mummy, what are we doing today? And I said, oh, I'm not quite sure yet. And my three-year-old piped up, Mummy, are we going to heaven today? <laughs> By which I quickly replied, I do hope not. <laughs> now, you see, here's a gap in the market. Mm -hmm. Because those two lads from Brighton who set up a Santa's Lapland adventure mm -hmm. in the New Forest, and it's all come unstuck, Yeah. Uh, with various customers who are very upset, got on the national press this, didn't it? It was on News at 10, mm -hmm. front page of the Sunday Mirror, Daily Mirror, somebody told me. Yeah. There's a very successful one, I believe, in Kent where they blow snow everywhere, they have log cabins, they have huge reindeer and sleds and proper elves. I don't know where they get them from. Um, what with so much business going on at the moment in Snow White, you know, and the Seven Dwarfs. I can't imagine that people who are no more than three feet tall must mm -hmm. be terribly in demand through November, December, and then nothing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... <laughs> The one in Kent's going really well, but the one in the New Forest um, <laughs> died on its arse, basically. Uh, with a couple of customers saying it was like a car boot sale. <laughs> and they couldn't find Santa anywhere, so they went round the corner of this sort of what, what was supposed to be a log cabin, but apparently it was one of those prefab sheds you can buy. Um, and he was there having a fag. Um. So it's closed. But what a great experience it would be, wouldn't it? <laughs> Heaven. Mm. Wouldn't that be an experience? Yeah. Would you have to, would you take your children to heaven? <laughs> you would, wouldn't you? Well, I don't know. You would, though, because the idea that you live forever and that you'll get to see Grandma again <laughs> is what takes you through the otherwise appallingly traumatic first six or seven years of your life. You believed in heaven, didn't you? Utterly, until you oh, were about yeah. eighteen. Yes. And wasn't that massively comforting? But I'm just wondering if when we got there, yes? the children would all be asking <laughs> where their relatives were. <laughs> yeah. And the cat. <laughs> uh, we'll take a quick call, although we've hardly got started yet. I'm grateful for your time. 01243 55 60 60. You're on Play Radio. Who's this? Oh, my God. It's Percy Clapham. How are you? Hello, dear boy. I'm very well. Oh, God. I'm, I'm, this is the second time I've been on the television this weekend. I'm really? <laughs> really excited but nervous. Yes, me too. Anyway. <laughs> well, well, well yes. Yes. Don't get too excited, but I know what that does to you. <laughs> Bob Staunton told me. Bob Staunton, I'm very excited about Bob Staunton coming back on the air. Um, one or two people around this, um, this, uh, this sort of port, port, portfolio of radio stations are a little bit uncomfortable about it, a little bit miffed to tell the truth, but Bob will be here on Christmas Eve, which is fantastic, Percy, isn't it? Well, it's, yeah, because it takes an hour of your programme, doesn't it? I don't mind that. Bob's a legend. Yeah, um, but that's not the first time it's happened, does it? I don't mind. Oh, Bob, yeah. No, I don't mind. You I can to argue with him on BBC Southern County. I did, I did, we, uh, we, we did have a bit of a bust up at one point, but that's all resolved now. Um, and uh, he and I, you know, will be absolutely fine. Are you there? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I sort of dro dropped off for a minute there. Um, yeah, no, I mean, Bob and I will be absolutely fine. I remember Bob, when I was a boy and Radio 2 got going, I remember he was the weekend, uh, swing jock, and I can well remember him standing in for, do you remember the mid-morning man on Saturdays, Andy Turnbull? I've heard of him, yes. Well, Bob, I remember Bob standing him in for him on a number of occasions and doing a great job, and that's National Radio 2, and we all know, you know, what that became in terms of national treasures so 
Well, I'm, I'm more into it when he's got a, a quiz or he's talking about pigeons and things like that. We're looking forward to his wisdom. I don't know what he's got lined up, but um, it's going to be unmissable radio on... It's not Christmas Eve. I believe it's the 23rd, actually. Yeah, December. Tuesday, isn't it? Yes. Tuesday it is. And Big Bob, uh, yeah. I've been to his website. He's not looking much worse than he was looking about four years ago. Well, I actually don't know what he looked like recently because big, he big... hasn't spoke to me since he got sacked from the Southern Counties. He's a big lad, as you know. Uh, if you've ever seen a picture of Bob, go to his website. I think if you go to um, to Google Bob Staunton, he's a big lad. He's, um, uh, he, he's not always clean-shaven uh, and he's usually pictured sitting in the corner of a bar but that's bob and we're all different he's like a gentle giant isn't he like uh, maybe a, a paul corgan with a few extra no pounds. I, I listen percy thank you very much indeed for your call i don't know about a gentle giant more like a fat thug <laughs> but thank you for your call oh one two four three fifty five sixty sixty and I have this from Ivan Brackenbury, who's just texted in. Thank you for this, Ivan. He says, after listening to <laughs> our local fool, Les Ross, and your enjoyment of his work, have you listened, heard of stand-up hospital radio comedian Ivan Brackenbury? His live show is just about the funniest thing I've heard in ages. What are you laughing at over there, Fanny? <laughs> what are you gone for? Are you what? Have you seen something we haven't? No, it's just the email wasn't from Ivan. It was about Ivan. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, yeah. Oh, so it is. Yeah. Oh, it's from Lee Wickstead. Mm. Okay. Oh, dear. Well, shall we... <laughs> let's put that in our pocket, shall we? Mm -hmm. And get to it later. Yes. Because I've been slightly diverted from my point, which is the main reason we should discuss conspiracy theories today. Right. Well, I'll get to my main point in just a okay. second. Earlier on, if you were listening... Good afternoon. <laughs> 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 it's February 2009. <laughs> I started the show by saying that besides welcoming Catherine Catt to the programme, who is our professional sex worker, and by the way, gentlemen in particular, if there are any questions that you've always wanted to ask somebody who is not in the slightest bit phased by sex, any aspect of sex, and when I say any aspect of sex, I mean any aspect of sex, any. Even some of those aspects of sex, gentlemen, which look in the most inaccessible darkest reaches of your libidos if there's anything you've ever wanted to ask somebody who knows more than anybody you will ever meet or talk to about sex then now's your chance you can email me now studio at playradiouk.com and Catherine Cat will be along at 10 o'clock but we're also talking about conspiracies Two reasons. One, because lots of people are very, very interested in conspiracies. I am, Fiona. Are you? You're I a woman. am. Are you? Well, sorry. But it's usually men who are interested in conspiracies. Women are more interested in cooking and mending. Oh, no, really? Uh, just, just, I don't just, think. Cooking up conspiracies, silly, maybe. A silly joke. Mm. Um, okay, but there was a big reason why I wanted to talk about conspiracies today, and that is because today, it was on this day in 1980, that John Lennon was shot murdered okay. mm -hmm. assassinated mm -hmm. some people feel that he had such political power or influence mm -hmm. rather um that his murder was an assassination and there are those you see who subscribe to the conspiracy theories surrounding lennon who believe that it was a bona fide assassination because it was carried out entirely for political reasons right and not the reasons which the court found that mark chapman shot him for which was because he wanted to be famous or notorious. Right. What do you think? What do I think? I think Mark Chapman was a nutcase who shot him um, because he was out of control of what he was doing and he was overtaken by events. That's what I think. Right. Uh, but we'll come to that a little bit later on. We'll also talk about conspiracy theories uh, in general mm -hmm. because they are very diverting. Mm. And uh, last week we had the lad... <clears throat> who has spent seven years in prison for crimes which were committed in pursuit of his belief that animals are being badly treated in medical research centres, mm -hmm. trying to persuade us that 9-11 was a conspiracy and that there's a World Bank which is running everything. 
and that George Bush and the Queen are related and that he was about to go on, I think, to say, and I think he believes this, <laughs> but he didn't actually say it on this show, but I'm told by the people that David Icke believes this, that the Queen and possibly George Best... George Best? <laughs> You pass that bottle of vodka over. <laughs> yes, the Queen and George Best are both lizards. <laughs> well, it sounds like something out of Doctor Who. Lizards. Rept vaguely reptilian. Something to do with the fact that, that the dinosaurs didn't die out, they just sort of... Evolved? Took yes, they took over. <laughs> but yes, I, but I don't know. Or they come from another planet. Which is what the Scientologists sort of believe, in that we... Uh, our souls came from another planet and embedded themselves in the highest life form they could find, which was the 212th ape. But the, is that conspiracy theory? Because if, 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 if the basis of what Scientologists believe can be considered somehow a conspiracy theory, mm -hmm. then so could the Bible and, Cor and the Koran. What Which makes, is hot water if you want it. What makes something a conspiracy theory? Okay. Well, what do you think at home, or listening, or on your PC, or on your laptop, or if you're podcasting this in the year 2027, and you're allowed by the ruling lizards <laughs> <laughs> to have your own thoughts? You don't know. <laughs> Can you imagine? Come back. <laughs> and we're all penned in fields waiting to be abattoired <laughs> and the lizards are out you know and they're running their own kind of tv and radio they've got what they want finally you know the x factor is all about you know who can lay the best egg or i don't know <laughs> who can lizards. eat the <laughs> <laughs> who can eat the most live mice in three minutes. John Sargent still does well. <laughs> <laughs> Gets to the quarters. <laughs> Pulls out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm gonna have to take a break. Uh, <clears throat> don't make me laugh. No. Got the news over there. Oh, you're going to read the news. Why Excellent. not? Play to UK. Headlines. One of the officials at the centre of the Baby P child abuse case has been dismissed with immediate effect. Sharon Shoesmith, who was head of children's services at Haringey Council in London, had already been suspended on full pay. But a panel of councillors has decided she'll receive no compensation. The toddler died after months of abuse despite being on the authorities' at-risk register. A Frenchman's been jailed for life for trying to kill schoolgirl Jessica Knight. The 14-year-old was walking through a park at Chorley in Lancashire listening to her iPod when she was stabbed 20 times. Police are dealing with what they describe as a disturbance at a young offenders prison in Aylesbury. Officers were called to the incident this morning and quickly cordoned off the site in Buckinghamshire. Security at Stansted Airport is under urgent review after environmental campaigners broke in. More than 50 flights were cancelled when they blocked the runway. Police have made 57 arrests. And today's been dubbed Mega Monday for online Christmas presents. More than 2 million are expected to be bought over the net. Clayton UK Weather. Rain affecting southern areas of England and Wales will spread steadily southeastwards, clearing the far southeast around dawn. Otherwise dry and clear with frost forming inland, but with scattered showers on western coasts and hills, these wintry over northern hills. Looking on to tomorrow, many areas dry and sunny but cold. Some showers on western coasts and hills, these wintry over northern hills. Feeling cold in the northwesterly breeze. You're up to date on Play 2 UK. PlayRadioUK.com, part of the Something Corporation. Right then, what was the web address? PassionOnline.co.uk Oh, you would look really sexy in that. Okay, that's in the shopping cart. Imagine the fun we could have with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, I've ordered something for you. Something for us. How about this for me? 
PassionOnline.co.uk has something for everybody with a fast, discreet delivery service, competitive pricing, and a free gift with every order for a limited time. See our massive product mix online right now. Click PassionOnline.co.uk, the world's sexiest online shop. Plato UK is proud to announce that Catherine Catt joins our unique schedule of talk hosts. Catherine is a world-renowned lady of the night and connoisseur of literature, opera, sculpture and performance. She joins us every Monday from 10, ready to talk about affairs of the heart and the world of art, as you would never hear anywhere else. From 10, Mondays on Plato UK. PlayRadioUK.com is dedicated to providing you with a fully interactive website and music service. Choose from 13 stations playing all kinds of music 24 hours a day. Find answers to your technical questions. Podcast your favourite shows. Download content to your mobile phone. Interact with other users in our forum. Buy music from your favourite artists and find out who's on when and what we're up to. PlayRadioUK.com. Internet radio your way. The Tommy Boyd Show, only on Play 2 UK. It's the 8th of December, uh, the anniversary of the assassination murder of John Lennon in New York. So we're talking conspiracy theories because I honestly believe that the nuttiest, cons- besides one or two plausible ones about Lennon's murder, the nuttiest conspiracy theory that I think I've ever heard is a conspiracy theory connected with the murder of John Lennon, which I'll get to a little bit later on, because that's what you do. Also going to be talking with Catherine Catt. Looking forward to that in a little over an hour's time. And Catherine's been doing what do we know this week? We don't. Um, well, she's been... She's had quite a busy week. Um... You take your time and look for it. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, she's the organised one, she tells me. We'll find out what Catherine is going to be talking about a little bit in five minutes' time. But right now it's over to Chris, who's called in. Hello, Christopher. How are you, Tommy? Do you know, I'm pretty well. I was knackered all day today, but I had one of those five-minute naps this afternoon, and it really seems to have turned oh, me around. Don't, don't do that. It's dangerous if you get into that. I did that the other, di- the other night. I went to sleep at about five o'clock, and I woke up again at ten. Well, that, thinking, that, thinking I'd get up in about yeah, an hour's time. Yeah, that, that's 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 not a power nap, is it? Then that's just well, it's asleep. Yeah. Of course, you don't do that. You need to have that kind of. Can you not sort of nap whereby you're asleep but you're half awake? No, I can't no, do that. I see, just go, I, see, what I do is I get in, into bed with yeah. my clothes on. You know, just fully clothed, just get into bed. Why? I don't know. I just like it. I know, it's, it's comforting, isn't it? Yeah. It's the same, like, when you go to a hot country and all you need is a sheet over you, it doesn't feel right. Yeah. You don't feel cocooned. Yeah, you need yeah. some sort of cushioning. Well, you need to feel like you're back in the womb. Yeah. That's what it is, protected. If I ever go for a nap, I like to just strip off and roll into the duvet. Cause it just is that why we like hot baths as well? Hot baths? Mm. Yeah, that's part of the reason. But don't, don't, don't let's leave the thought of Fiona stripping off and... <laughs> Christopher, you, you, you missed a trick there. Or, uh, uh, but I'm yeah, not going to. Especially I'm a really cold burning. duvet. A cold duvet? Yes, so you can feel it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want... No, I like it to be body temperature in there. Mm-hmm. So what I did is what I used to do when I was small, before there was central heating. Mm-hmm. You'd go to bed and the sheets would be so cold, it was painful mm-hmm. on your feet. So mm. you'd, you'd, be, you'd ask to be allowed to keep your socks on. Yeah. But then you get into the bed, and what you do straight away is put, put the bed clothes up over your head mm. and breathe. You go... <laughs> <laughs> and that would heat the bed up for you. Right. Yeah. I, I had this problem. Oh, yeah, go on. No, I was just going to say that I, I don't like the room too hot. I like to get... I do like getting into a cold bed. I don't like wearing socks in bed. No. I don't like... Actually, yeah. I don't like socks at all. I have to say, I am slightly digressing now, but I don't like anything on my feet at all. Mm. I know what you mean. If I'm required to laugh genuinely out loud, um, one trick, if I don't feel as though I can fake it, okay, is to think of a person, just a man, wearing nothing but a pair of fairly naff socks, (laughs) standing there. 
And I'm now <laughs> going to see if it works, Christopher, if I imagine you. <laughs> yeah, it's already working. When you, when, you, when you started saying it, I thought it's got something to do with stop, so I was laughing already. Yeah, I'm just imagining you standing there then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it works. I have got socks on, but I do have a I know, other thing. I know. Yeah. yeah. So mm. you went and ha you went and had a five-hour nap, and that screwed you over. Whereas you asked me if I was okay, and I said yes because I had a a proper cat nap, ten minutes. Yeah. But you rang because. Yeah. Um. You, you know how you were sort of uncontrollably laughing uh, before the news. Yeah. I was just thinking, maybe it would make the news more entertaining if you spent the whole time, whilst the other person's reading the news, trying to make them laugh. Um, well, it would do, but there are some news stories you don't want to have that happen to. I mean, you know, 14-year-old girls being stabbed 20 times. Yeah, that's you, a good point, yeah. So this is it. You, towards the end, you can. Maybe if, yeah, maybe you need something specifically that you should read out mm. and try and distract the person as much as you can. Hmm. Okay, well, if Fiona's not here tomorrow night, so... Oh, what Steve, a shame. Steve, I know, it is, it is. Steve Paul will be here from 8 until 10, <clears throat> and I'm looking for features from 10 until 12, and I'll be here on my own, apart from the good listener, which is, oh. um, yeah, a departure, but I'm keen to see how that works out as a piece of, as a piece of communication. Thank you for your creative th thinking, Christopher. Nice to talk to you. Yeah, and you. Sleep well. But you see, that student time, Fiona, he, he's, he slept for five hours, mm. and then you're not... If you sleep from five in the afternoon until ten at night, you're not going to go to sleep no. until four in the morning, are you? That's right. I have a question for you. You know when you have a... If you try... Cause, right, okay. Occasionally, I will try and have a nap. I might have an hour or two where I think, like, if I'm going to be up late, right, I'm going to go and try and have a sleep. Mm. But I can never, ever go to sleep. The only time that I can go to sleep mm. is if I don't have anything um, pressing to go to later in mm. that day. If, mm. I, you know, if I know that the day is mine, mm. then I can sleep. But if I've got a couple of hours that I just want to go and get my head down and get some sleep because I know that I'm going to need to, you know, need get some rest, but I can never actually go to sleep. I am, I'm always in that sort of state where yes. if somebody walked in the room and spoke to me, I'd yeah. be able to answer them straight away. You know, mm. is that is that actually beneficial? That kind of bit, sleep, I think. What do you think? Listening, text, email, Skype, call, email studio at playradio. dot com uk.com studio at playradiouk.com you can call 01243 55 60 60 the skype address is play.radio.uk how about the light <clears throat> have you ever used those eye shades that you can get on planes no that helps does it yes earplugs have you ever used earplugs well, that helps. Right. That I don't helps. think it's a noise factor, though. No, but it just cocoons you. It, 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 it um, in, introvertalizes you. Right. I mean, if you're aware of the outside world, a lorry going past, mm. seagull. Ah, 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 ah. That was a good seagull. It was. Do you want to hear my train barrier? Go on, then. Ding, 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 ding. That's <laughs> good, isn't it? That's going through the night in France. It's very, it's very, um, erotic and uh, <laughs> diverting if you're on a train going through france in the middle of the night we caught a midnight train from paris right. it was going all the way down to spain mm -hmm. so all through the night the train rattled through france mm -hmm. pitch black and the guard came round with a little trolley mm -hmm. and he was selling this orange juice we were only 14 it was mm -hmm. a school trip <laughs> and it made us laugh because the orange juice was called shit with a p <laughs> And we thought that was fantastic. <laughs> All we really wanted was some of his cognac. And he was prepared to sell it to us because it's, it's compulsory in France if you're 14 to drink cognac. You're not mm. allowed to drink soft drinks. Really? I made that bit up. Yeah, I think you This did. was 1960 something. Anyway, so we all bought our bottles of Peshit <laughs> and we went back. And I was sleeping on the luggage rack because mm -hmm. it was eight to a carriage and we couldn't stretch out. So we drew lots mm -hmm. and Podge Pembroke got the actual seat he was a big lad because i was a gymnast i was on the 
luggage rack, mm. which was very uncomfortable. I bet it was. It was, because it was just netting, uh, just like fish netting. A bit like a hammock. Then. Yeah, except there were metal <laughs> bars <laughs> along it. So I had, a metal, I had to balance a metal anyway. <laughs> but all through the night, Every time we went through a, a French level crossing, there was this really haunting noise. It just went, ding, 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 ding. And it, stay with me. Anyway, <laughs> if you want to sleep, try eye shades and earplugs. You can buy these lovely yellow foam ones now that you squeeze, push in your ear, and they expand and fill your ear. Mm. And then it's impossible. Really? Mm, they're very good. Do they really work? Yep. Earplugs. And don't drink tea or coffee, you know, all those things. And you know the best way to have sleep in the afternoon? Go on. Is to have sex. Yeah. You know that. You know. But, well, I know, but it's not something you can organise, is it? Mm. And even if you can, it takes, you know, half an hour. By which time <laughs> you, you're going to want to get going again because you've only got half an hour to have a nap. Mm. Did I ever tell you very quickly, just before we move on to the great conspiracy theory surrounding the assassination of John Lennon, which occurred on this day in 1980, hand up at the back, Dutton. I was just going to say, before we move on, is it the act of having sex or is it the... Um... Endorphins. Yeah. I blame them. Okay. That's or, fine. Whenever I hear endorphins, I always think of dolphins. <laughs> I see all these little dolphins sort of, you know, going up and down through your bloodstream mm -hmm. they look like dolphins in my mind that little <laughs> smile in mm, dolphins yes so it's 1974 and i've landed the plum job of being senior traffic reporter on london's new startup all talk all news all the time radio station lbc mm -hmm. where news comes first mm -hmm. and i'm required to be at scotland yard at 5 30 in the morning and living in Brighton, that's a bugger. Yeah. So, I rent a room mm -hmm. in Kilburn. Right. Round the corner from where not one but four IRA operatives were living. <laughs> oh, God. And I know that because they used to go to the same restaurant as me <laughs> where I'd go in the evening and have my liver and bacon. <laughs> and I used to hear them talking about it. This is the God's honest truth mm. about planting one here and planting one there and gold is green and a two-pounder. They were arrested about six weeks afterwards, and it was them. Yeah. They sat there, and I'm here. <laughs> and they talked in Irish accents about bombs and things. And I'm working at Scotland Yard. <laughs> what do you mean they were talking about bombs and things? One night, <laughs> I heard them go, So I went home, and I thought, well, it's not going to happen, I thought, but if a bomb goes off in Golders Green in a pillar box any time between now and Christmas, I'm going to have to mention it, aren't I? <laughs> so I woke up the next morning and I turned on my little radio in my little room in Kilburn, right? And um, the headlines, Douglas Cameron, read, last night in Kilburn, a bomb exploded in a pillar box. The IRA have claimed responsibility. I thought, what the hell? It must be them or they knew about it. Well, you could have stopped that. This, by the way, this is a God's honest true story. It's ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and so I then went to work and I'm sat at Scotland Yard with a bloody great copper here next to me, a bloody great copper that side of me, a bloody great copper opposite me, and I kept thinking, no, surely not. Don't make a fool of yourself. In any case, I had a job to do, which was to say, you know, that the elevated section of the M4 just going over Brentford was very solid this morning. <laughs> so I got on with that. Yeah. But here's my point. Have you ever heard of a broadcaster called Nicky Horn? Yes. Yes. Well, he was doing a late night show on Capital, mm -hmm. and the bloke in the room next to me in this big house where I'd rented a room mm -hmm. used to like to listen to Nicky Horn from 10 o'clock in the evening until midnight. Now, if you're up at 4.30, you mm -hmm. don't want that, do you? No. But it wasn't actually in the same house. He was the adjoining house, mm -hmm. and I couldn't be asked to go round, ring the doorbell, say, turn it down, you mm -hmm. know, in the any case, he might have been a big bloke. <laughs> so... It's now half past 11, and I've got to be up to give a sort of a performance mm -hmm. in about five hours' time. So what I did was... Have I told you this story? No. You sure? Yeah. Because I've told it before. Well, but it's a bloody me. good one. Hmm. It's a bloody good one, this. The woman who rented me the, ha the room in the house mm -hmm. was Gabby Roslin's hmm. great-aunt. Really? Yes. 
because I got recommended it by Gabby Rosalind's dad, who was a newsreader. Clive right. wasn't at this place. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So it's half past eleven at night and I can't sleep because of Nicky Horn playing rock music. <laughs> so I needed some earplugs. But this is 1974 and they don't do them. All I had was a little box of tea bags mm -hmm. that I'd taken up there so I could make myself a cup of tea in my room. <laughs> like you do. Mm -hmm. So I shredded one of the tea bags and I put it in one ear. <laughs> Okay, and mm -hmm. I shredded another one. I put that in the other ear. <laughs> Things you do. Mm -hmm. And I went back to sleep. Now, I haven't mentioned that in the nicest possible way, Gabby Roslin's auntie was a little bit, <laughs> a little bit, ooh. <laughs> she once said to me, do you know how to dust a house? I said, I don't. <laughs> she said, well, she said, you must dust the highest places first. <laughs> And then all the way down to the skirting boards, which you dust last. If you dust the skirting boards first, and then dust your mantelpiece on the top of your dresser, the dust from the dresser will fall on the skirting boards, you see. I said, oh, right. So she was a little bit... Mm -hmm. Now, here's the lovely bit of the story, right? Two o'clock in the morning, I woke up with this pounding pain in my right ear because the tea bag, right was working its way towards my brain. You know, I'd been lying on that side and I'd pushed it in. Really? Yeah. So I'd, I'd screwed it up into a little ball and pushed it in. It's dangerous. I know. So I'm panicking now. Panicking. Mm-hmm. And I, I, so I put on a pair of jeans and I padded along the corridor and I knocked on Mrs. Marine's door at 2.30 in the morning. And she came, she's a big woman and she was wearing a pink sort of dressing gown thing with white fur trim <laughs> and a wig on poof, and a great big edna Everidge glasses she was about 5 11 and she said yes and i said mrs marine can you help me i've got a tea bag lodged in one ear <laughs> oh no and she just went certainly you see there are times when eccentric people are what you want <laughs> because a sensible person would have gone I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. And I'd have had to go, I've got a tea bag lodged in one ear. <laughs> and they'd have gone, kind of a pervert are you? <laughs> or what, you couldn't afford a donkey? Or, <laughs> you know. So what but did she, she just, do? no, she just didn't bat an eyelid. She just went, yes, yeah, certainly, sit on the bed. So I sat on her bed, <laughs> she went and got a pair of tweezers, mm -hmm. and she winkled this tea bag, complete with some wax, <laughs> out of my lug hole. <laughs> Gave it to me and said, there you are. And I said, thank you very much indeed. Good night. Good night. And the next day, not a thing was said. Right. But that's the value of buying commercially approved BSI earplugs. <laughs> as opposed to adopt, adapt <laughs> and invent. Mm. Okay, quick reminder of our email address, which is studio at playradiouk.com. Our phone number is 01243 55 60 60 and our Skype address is play.radio.uk. It's Tommy. Fiona is here this Monday evening. It's 20 to 9. If you're live, good day around the world and hi if you're podcasting. This evening we have Catherine Cap. Any questions that you would like us to put to Catherine, you can do it anonymously if you like. A good way of doing that is to email. If you're listening on forums, I mean if you're listening and you're on various forums talking amongst yourselves about what you talk about plus what's going on the show um i'd be delighted to plug your forums if you're interested in new members so drop us an email or skype us with details of your forums because we've had through to catherine in the last three weeks two people have been nominated by forums to go and skype to go on skype and to talk to her so I have a feeling there are a lot of people on forums who are gagging to ask Catherine questions and talk to Catherine about what she does. Because sex is far and away the most fascinating thing I think there is in our lives. And Catherine is somebody who does it all day, every day, and is clearly a sensitive, caring, intelligent person who speaks very articulately about her specialist subject so if there is anything that you would like to talk about um you can skype chat us play.radio.uk or email studio at playradiouk.com 
PlayRadioUK.com, part of the Something Corporation. Play 2 UK's talk shows are expanding. The Sunday Roast from 8pm, radio you won't hear anywhere else. Mondays from 8, myself, Tommy Boyd with at 10. Catherine Catt live from her dungeon. The Mistress on Art, Theatre, Opera and The Boudoir. Tuesdays, Steve Paul and Ali tell it like it is. Wednesday and Thursday, Mike Mendoza, Gadgets, Current Affairs and Life. And there's more to come. Check it out. Talk on Play 2 UK. My dad knows how to keep my mum sweet. He logged on to Play Radio UK and treated her to some amazing Swarovski jewellery from the Scala jewellery. My mum's so lucky because the Scala jewellery designed all their jewellery in the UK and then it's handmade in Italy with Swarovski stones. They design jewellery for celebrities and royalty too. It's probably the best costume jewellery in the world. <laughs> so come on all you dads, go to playradiouk.com and click on the Scala jewellery today. The world's favourite website creator is celebrating. Moonfruit.com has now helped over 2 million people like you make their website dreams a reality. Moonfruit's award-winning design tools let you create a professional website in simple, easy steps. And you don't need to be a web wizard to make it happen. Go to Moonfruit.com right now and take a look for yourself at some fantastic websites already enjoying massive success. Packages start from less than £3 a month. Create, register, host and support your very own world-class website today with Moonfruit.com. Play to UK, the Tommy Boyd Show. Let's have a word with that. Is it Basil who Skyped us? Hello, oh, yes. Hello, Can you hear me, Tommy? Yeah, very well. Oh, good. I've just, um, I don't know what I'm doing. I've just downloaded Skype and uh, I've, I, haven't, I haven't got a proper headset. I'm just using a microphone and a pair of headphones. Well, the great thing about Skype, uh, dear boy, is that it actually sounds as though you're sat next to us in the studio, so you're doing nothing wrong. Where, where oh, are you? Good. What are we calling you? Are you Basil? Basil, that's right, yeah. All right, and um, whereabouts are you Skyping from, Basil? I'm in Bromley. A beautiful, leafy part of south-east London. Responsible for some of the great pantomimes at the Churchill Theatre, not... <laughs> <laughs> and responsible also for scuppering Ken Livingston the first time he tried to introduce a congestion charge, if I remember rightly. Wasn't it the Bromley Four, or is that way before your time? Uh, it's before, well, it probably isn't before my time, but I don't remember it. Don't worry about it. OK, so is this your first time of Skyping, period? It's, uh, yeah, yeah, this is my very first time I've ever used Skype, and I've, I've done it specially to call you. Well, it just sounds fantastic. I'm so excited about Skype. It just beats... Hang on a second, I'm going to get rid of this caller because they're so 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> Retro! <laughs> Retro! Hello? Hello, Tommy! Who's that? It's Alan! You're so 20th century, Alan. Get with the, get with the programme. Well, I don't know what the topic is, like, because I'm not... No, I'm, I'm, just I'm talking about your, your technology, son. You need Skype. L listen to Basil. He's studio quality. Say, say hello to Alan Basil. Hello. Is that Alan Caddick? Yes, it is, Basil. Good evening. Good evening. Nice to meet you. And where about the country or in the world where you're from? I'm in Bromley, which is south London, really. Oh, uh, well, you're talking to Bromley. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. That's very good, Basil. Stay there, Basil. We'll just deal with uh, okay. uh, with uh, a, a sub quality, Alan. Go on then, Alan. I got a topic one by you. You know the Christmas Top Forty, which is a national institution. In the last couple of years, both the ITV and the X Factor. And I'm wondering what the odds of it being. Christmas number one again, because I feel that Cliff Richard could do it this year. The, odds, not the odds on it being the X Factor, the odds on it being the X Factor are five to one on. Well, well, well Cliff Richard is still can't be very three to one. Yes, and John Sargent, you can get some twenties <laughs> about him if you want. <laughs> Alan, I suggest you do your nuts on John Sargent. <laughs> what about Bob the Builder? Thank you for your call, Alan. You see, Basil, uh, now how did that sound for you, listening to Alan talking to you on the phone there, Basil? Well, it wasn't too bad. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't what you call crystal clear, but I could hear what he was saying. Yeah. So the process of Skyping, just to remind everybody, uh, Basil, you would give it, I mean, for ease, 10 out of 10? 
Yeah, and uh, apparently it's free. Totally. As far as I know. <laughs> totally. So This is a, a, an added bonus. It's huge, isn't it? Yeah. What have you been up to today then, Baz? Well, I've been working today. Um, I'm looking forward to the weekend. I'm off to Lingfield for the racing. What's happening on... What's happening they've Saturday got some, at Lingfield? They've got some jump racing at Lingfield on Saturday, oh, which is that's quite unusual right, because it's yeah. nearly always all-weather flat racing. It is, yes. I had a horse that won a couple of... Um, the all-weather at Lingfield that won a couple of times, but the trainer refused to go because he said it was beneath him. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who's jumping at Lingfield on Saturday, then? Do you have any uh, idea of the card? No, not yet. But there's one horse uh, of Paul Nichols called Picture This that that um, that's supposed to be running there so i'm looking forward to backing that one if it does you you, you can't go wrong following him can you at the moment not usually no i, I followed him all the way to Sandown last saturday and had a now, couple of winners wait a minute yes now ah punjabi only just scraped in by the skin of his oh, that, teeth that was, yeah that, that's that was a weather bit, i mean yeah yeah but hey yeah, master, masterminded looks all right doesn't it yeah, yeah, oh yeah, he looks he looks extremely good. Well, he's the highest rated jumper, I think, in the country. Yeah. But I was a bit disappointed that, that his other horse, Twist Magic, um, who was going really well at the time, he fell, so... Yeah. It might have been a bit closer if he'd carried on going, but... I'm just going to see if I there can get at the races up so that we can have a quick look at... Um, wait a minute, can we get Google on this uh, PC yeah. here? Yeah, here we go, look. Darling? Ready? Yeah. Okay, that'll do it. All right. Uh, so, as Paul Nichols, you you follow generally speaking, or is it just on sa uh, Saturday's picture? This you've got in mind. Uh, yeah, at the moment. Yeah, I mean, there's there's um, not much happening this week. I try to avoid the sort of smaller meetings because they're a bit too unpredictable for betting. Well, um, I've done decently following um, the big trainers in the novice handicap, uh, the novice hurdles and chases at the small courses uh simply because uh they go there to win to get their horses in the habit of win nicky henderson is particularly adroit he's in he? excellent form at the moment as well yes he is although he, he went now where did he, he went to kempton about a week ago with a really strong hand and came away with nothing i think he had six runners they all looked good they were all starting favorite or second favorite and they all went down the swanee I'm just having a look, see yeah, if I can get... Like that, yeah. yeah. So where are we? Lingfield would be Saturday the 6th? Oh, no. 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 I'm on, I'm on at the races. Yeah, I'm on at the races for you, but I can't get Saturday's card up. It only goes to Friday. Never mind. Never mind. Uh, you mentioned that you've been at work all day. What evil do you do, Basil? Well, um, mostly landscape gardening. Uh, uh, that, that, that sounds like a grand summer job. <laughs> yes, it's not quite so good this time of the year. What were you doing today? Were you out in the outdoors? Yeah, I'm always out in the outdoors. I, I'm an outdoor sort of person, really. Right. Is it your own firm? Are you a one-man band or do you work for somebody else? No, I'm a one-man band. Beautiful. So Beautiful. Um, I'm my own boss. Lovely. What sort of wheels have you got? I've only got an estate car. Okay. Because sometimes you see them, don't they? They progress to one of those rather sexy open back truck things that David Beckham drives around. I've always wanted one of those. Oh, I think they're just a bit too flashy for me. They are a bit too flashy, yes. You're quite right. Quite right. I've just got simple tastes, Tommy. And earth under your fingernails, what's left of them? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, Basil, um, welcome to the fold. Uh, it's fantastic talking to you on Skype, and I'm really grateful for your call. Well done with the. I'll, I'll call you again yeah i want to make sure that you know that you're more than welcome anytime anybody on skype is halfway to being a presenter on the show that's how i see it if you ever need a, a racing correspondent let me know now, now there's a thought isn't there there's a thought i could pop up with a, with a tip for the week do you fancy a tip for the week thing then basil's tip basil's what we call it we do to come up with something naff basil's banker that's it, Basil's Banker, yeah. Basil's Banker, and you're saying, picture this, on sun uh, Saturday, at oh, Lingfield. Sat Saturday, yeah, at Lingfield, yeah, All right, but, runs. but here's the acid question, Nichols trains, but who's going to ride? 
Um, Will it be Tony? I don't think. I don't think. Um, yeah, I don't think Ruby Wall should be back. Yeah, it, well, it depends, really. I suppose what, what other horses he's got. Well, it'd Sam... be probably Tony McCoy or Sam Thomas, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean Ham, Sam Thomas. They sent him across to where did they send him Saturday? Tony had the big ride, didn't he? And yeah, they sent, yeah. They four sent, winners at the stand down. Uh, they sent Sam down somewhere to ride three or four pretty good horses. Get his, com- chap star, I think. Get his confidence back. But I, didn't, yeah. I, did, I found myself preoccupied. And I didn't look to see whether he'd um, had any winners there. All stayed on. Yeah. Yeah, he'd had a, um, a few um, unlucky spills and, and a couple that yeah. probably were his fault, but there you are. True. Do you ever do um, multiple bets or do you like to just go race by race? I used to do multiple bets and I realised that I struggled to find one winner, so I just stick to that. I think it's... it's it's a clue to how difficult it is to bring a Yankee or a Heinz in. The clue lies in the fact that the bookmakers leave out slips for you to do those bets. Exactly. I think any race that's heavily advertised or that sort of thing, it's probably um, the races they want you to bet on. Yes. McCrerick says, if there's a bet and there isn't a slip for it in the bookies, then give it some serious <laughs> thought. And he said that yeah. one, of the, one of the best bets is an each-way double on quite warm favourites because, you know, you can get them... Say you get two favourites at evens running in two separate races. You would think, yeah. wouldn't you, that if you back them each-way double and they both came second or third, you'd hardly get your money back. But in actual fact, yeah. an each-way double on two even-money favourites will win you your stakes back. And he said the reason that's a good bet, he said, the reason you can be sure that's a good bet is because you will never see an each-way double slip in the bookies. That's a good point. Yeah, he's probably right there. You're very he's a flatter- wise man. You're very flattering, and therefore you can definitely call again, Basil. Thank you for your <laughs> Skype, dear boy. Um, nice to speak to you, Tommy. Don't work too hard. I won't. N- nor you. Of it's work. I'll be back breaking, <laughs> is it? What a nice man Basil is. Wasn't that a good Skype line? Yeah. It does varies, doesn't it? What do you think it varies with? Some Skypes are just a little bit tinny. Still way better than telephone lines. Mm. It's interesting that he says that he was only using some, what did he say, some headphones and a, and a little mic. He, didn't, no. he said he didn't have any proper ones, but, I mean, that's the job, doesn't it? We should say probably better than some we've had. We've got a Skype from um, this. It says, the forum unofficial Tommy talk can be entered by adding david.j.james to contacts and following the link in the mood. Do you understand that? I don't, Fiona. Um, It's perfectly well explained, and people who know what forumising is won't have any difficulty. What I've said is, what I've said is, if you're on forums or you want to get onto forums, Mm -hmm. or you run a forum and you're quite happy to recruit new members... Yeah. Um, talking about the show as it's going out, I think it's great. Run a parallel thing like that, which Mm -hmm. we don't moderate, somebody else does, the member of the listening public. Mm. I think that's great. So I'm quite happy to promote that. And so we've got this one. The forum... Well, you're saying to get into it, you need to add um, David James to your contacts first. So if you're already on Skype, you need to add him to your contacts, which is david.j.james. Okay. Um, and then he's saying you have to follow the link in in the mood, whatever that is. But I guess that'll be obvious once you're... But, but he's written, and following the link in the, in quotation marks, mood. Mm-hmm. Nobody is barred from this chat, unlike all the other chats, unless they do something illegal. Yeah. Because then things get competitive, don't they? Yes. Our chat's better than your chat. And that's great. Oh, yeah. Because all human beings are competitive animals, aren't they? I am. Oh, yeah. Are me you too. competitive? Yeah. Desperately competitive. Yeah. Desperately competitive. I was listening to the Sunday roast last night, mm-hmm. and they were doing um, Umatron. Oh, right. And it was who can do the longest Umatron. <laughs> and uh, I think Matt did 42 seconds, which was pretty good. But uh, on my drive here today, yeah. I was sitting in the car, and <laughs> I turned the radio off and just timed myself doing Umatron. Did you? <laughs> because I wanted to know that I can beat Matt. Isn't that pathetic? <laughs> But true. It's slightly worrying, yes. Know thyself. Let's take a couple of <laughs> emails, shall we? Mm-hmm. In our inbox. 
we'll do it, shall I? Would you? Thank oh, you. Yeah, there we go. OK, so, first of all, the term conspiracy theory. We're talking conspiracy theories this evening. John Lennon was murdered on this day in 1980, and two strong conspiracy theories have sprung up. Uh, they feature a lot in American talk radio shows suggesting who might have killed Lennon other than Mark Chapman. But one of the reasons I want to talk about the conspiracies tonight is because the John Lennon murder has attached to it the most ridiculous conspiracy theory, I think, personally, I have ever heard. And it is put forward in all seriousness by a lot of people mm -hmm. in the United States. And we'll get to that shortly. But the business of conspiracy theory, Sonny has emailed, thank you for this. The term conspiracy theory carries with it a negative connotation when in reality by definition a conspiracy is simply two or more, more people getting together to plan something in secret history is full of provable and acknowledged conspiracies many involving governments it seems the mainstream media cannot say the word conspiracy without adding the word theory afterwards which gives the impression of an idea that cannot be proven the truth is, there are some ridiculous theories out there, but there are also some very well-researched alternative views of history that present very compelling evidence that certain events may not have happened the way we're taught. Something like the official version of the Kennedy assassination, I think, has been proven beyond any doubt to be false. And if the evidence was presented in a court of law, I think a jury would come to the conclusion that the version as presented by the Warren Commission cannot be true. Anyone that studies history will find it littered with provable and admitted conspiracies. Who knows what will be accepted as fact in 50 to 100 years. Sonny, that's interesting that you mm. should quote the Kennedy assassination as being almost certainly a conspiracy mm -hmm. and that the conclusions of the Warren Commission were almost certainly false. Because having studied it quite a lot, Sonny, myself, um, I'm now of the opinion that Lee Harvey Oswald did it, yeah. acting alone. Because right. there are bits of the conspiracy theories that Warren Commission conspiracy theorists mm -hmm. haven't had a chance to say, well, if you think that there was somebody else besides Lee Harvey Oswald, what was Lee Harvey Oswald doing in the building? He'd worked in that building for long before it was decided that the president's motorcade would come past it. Right. And if he was a patsy, surely they would have found the route that the car was taking mm -hmm. and then planted lee harvey oswald in the building yeah but if he was set up as a patsy and some say he was set up as a patsy years before the assassination there's a complete hole in that theory mm -hmm. which is that oswald had been working at the book depository for months he got his, he was given the job by i think his uh, sister-in-law he was estranged from his wife at the time but she found him this sort of dead-end job at the book depository, wheeling old books around. Mm -hmm. And then some weeks later, weeks later, it was decided that the motorcade would come past. Well, how could they possibly have predicted that? Now, of course, a good conspiracy theorist would say, well, ah, what happened, you see, was that the CIA and the FBI and the Pentagon and the KGB and Castro and, um, oh, just about any sort of right-wing law and order organization you care to think about the klu klux klan let's pitch them in there as well shall we and j edgar hoover and the rest of them they all decided once they got lee harvey a job in their book depository to reroute the motorcade past the book depository so that their patsy could be framed for the job but that's ridiculous Hmm. And so it's not in the conspiracy theory. So why did he shoot him? Why did he shoot him? Yeah. Because he was deranged. Because he was a gun nut. Because he practiced shooting at targets 75 yards away. And he waited until the motorcade, the, gun, the car carrying Kennedy was exactly the distance mm -hmm. from his gun that he was used to shooting. And because I think that in his psychotic state, mm. he felt that there was something inevitable about the fact that he, a man who had already failed in an attempt to assassinate somebody else, mm -hmm. a senator, who was in his garden about six weeks before the Kennedy assassination, mm -hmm. and he felt a breeze at his neck, and then a, 
A hundredth of a second later, a bullet thudded into the ground next to him. And he realised that somebody had taken a pot shot at him. Right. So he went down. Right. Obviously. Mm -hmm. And managed to survive that. Yeah. Well, it's almost certain that Oswald was mm -hmm. the man who did that. Yeah. Oswald was a man who wanted to shoot important people. So he did it just for the hell of it. Whether or not he, there was any kind of connection between him and the New Orleans gay mafia... Which in Oliver Stone, yeah, which in Oliver Stone's film and a number of the reasonably well documented conspiracy theories, it suggested that they provoked Lee Harvey Oswald, who was possibly bisexual himself, hence his involvement in this gay mafia thing. Uh, why did he shoot him? I think because he felt that there was an inevitability about it that the president should be put on a plate. Right. Driving past the building where he worked. He had his gun. He wanted to be an assassin. The president was going to drive past the window where he worked. I honestly, genuinely believe that, that, that people who think that two and two makes five mm. would believe that and would do it for that reason. So, Sonny, I, I'm no longer somebody who b believes that um, that there was a massive conspiracy about the murder of jfk but thank you very much indeed for your email studio at playradiouk.com is the email address once again that's studio at playradiouk.com um we'll take some important announcements uh and a reminder that Catherine cat our art with tart tart with art uh, will be along at uh, 10 o'clock this evening but right on the back end of this um we'll examine the conspiracy theories that surround the murder of John Lennon, which happened on this day in the year 1980. PlayRadioUK.com, part of the Something Corporation. Here she is, my sexy new MP4 player from City Dash Sales. The latest technology giving me music and video wherever I go in a range of stunning colours, all for just £60. And here are her matching speakers. Gorgeous! Plus picture key rings, audio visual baby monitors. Oh, she's so cute. And the baby's kind of nice too. The hottest audio visual equipment straight to your drawer. Just visit city-sales.co.uk. City-sales. Looking good. Sounding great. Play 2 UK is proud to announce that Catherine Catt joins our unique schedule of talk hosts. Catherine is a world-renowned lady of the night and connoisseur of literature, opera, sculpture and performance. She joins us every Monday from 10, ready to talk about affairs of the heart and the world of art, as you would never hear anywhere else. From 10, Mondays on Play 2 UK. Live to the UK. UK. News, information, entertainment, and the best music from the past 40 years. This is Play 2 UK. Tommy Boyd. Call 01243 55 60 60. Email studio at playradiouk.com. Skype play.radio.uk. Now, live from the south coast of England, the Tommy Boyd Show, only on Play 2 UK. So, John Lennon was killed, how many years ago was that then, 1980? Uh, 28? 28. How old had you been then? 1980, I was yeah. nine. You were nine, I was nine. wondering how old John Lennon would have oh. been. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, can I have that? Yes, you can. You leave it alone for a second, you're a good girl. Well, I was going to ask your question. Yeah, go on then. No, I was going to look it up for you. Oh, no, that's all right, I'm trying to find a piece of audio. Okay. Do we know when he was born? <laughs> Well, he was about 30-something, wasn't he, when he was killed? Right. Yeah. No, I'm just having trouble getting up a piece of, um, a piece of what we call footage. Yeah. Which I'll get to in just a second. What's that one there, then? I beg your pardon? What's that one there? <laughs> that one there doesn't seem to want... That well, that one, one there, no, that doesn't seem to want to play if you click on it. We need another computer in here, don't we? Peter Collins has emailed me. Perhaps you would... Uh, shall I read this out? Because Peter Collins is somebody... Um, who can be very, a little bit uh, unacceptable on occasions, it has to be said. And Peter Collins says, um, You don't have to talk some crap, Tommy. Anybody that knows about betting will tell you that if you have an each-way double on two evens, you won't get your money back. 
Based on it will pay evens for the place when in fact you will get odds of four to six on an each way double on two evens based on best place, quarter of the odds. Oh yes, and before you shout at me, I worked in a bookmaker for six years, so I think I know what I'm on about. Okay. Which one was that, Peter, from Birmingham? I'd be very interested to know. Which... And it's not a trick question. In the morning of the day he shot, December the 8th, 1980, John Lennon is visited by the photographer, Annie Leibovitz, in the afternoon by a San Francisco disc jockey. Like being a politician, you know. And I, I, what I really got through this five years is I'm not running for office. I like to be liked. I don't like to offend people. I would like to be a happy, contented person. I don't want to have to sell my soul again, as it were, to have a hit record, it's, I've discovered that I can live without, without it and it makes it happier for me, but I'm not going to come back in and try and create a persona. And he and Yoko leave by their limo to go to the Record Plant Studios around about five in the afternoon. There's a small crowd, as there usually was, outside the Dakota building and Lennon pauses to sign a few autographs, including signing Mark Chapman's copy of Double Fantasy. Chapman accepts the signature. Lennon apparently asks him, is that all you want? He says yes. They go to the studio to mix down a track called Walking on Thin Ice. And get back at about 10 to 11 in the evening. Quite early considering... Except Lennon wanted to be there when his son Sean went to bed. Yoko Ono leaves the limo first and walks several yards ahead of Lennon through the archway, next to which is a small sentry box used by the doorman, towards the six steps leading up to the reception area, which takes you up to the apartments. She gets there as Lennon walks past a figure lurking in the shadows who allows Lennon past without a word. According to some reports, several steps after Lennon has walked past the figure, who is Chapman, Chapman steps out and says, Mr. Lennon. John may or may not have half turned, Mr. Lennon. but then Chapman begins firing. Five shots, four of which hit Lennon on the left side of his back. Lennon staggers up the six steps to the reception area and his last words were, To Yoko, I'm shot. Still semi-conscious when the ambulance arrived, Lennon was vomiting blood and fleshy material and he passed away in the ambulance, which arrived at the hospital at 1107. What happened in the moments after the shooting by the archway is reasonably well documented but has somehow passed into folklore. The doorman emerged from his box and said to the young man with the gun, Do you know what you've just done? The man, Chapman, is said to have replied, I've just shot John Lennon. Whereupon he pulled out a copy of a book called The Catcher in the Rye by Salinger and started absently thumbing through it and he was looking at the book when the police arrived in the time that passes between the arrival of the police and the imprisonment of Chapman for Lennon's murder a number of questions are asked and not answered the result of which is that four or five shaky conspiracy theories surrounding the murder of Lennon are still being talked about today. The first question is asked by the police when they arrive. They query the allegation that Chapman is the gunman. As they say, he doesn't look like one and he hasn't run away. Sometime later, the courts ask, for many people, too few questions and judge that Chapman acted alone and shot Lennon, apparently in a bid for fame. But Chapman's words on arrest that he felt nothing and had an empty mind, alerted British legal expert Fenton Bresler to conspiracy theory number one, that Chapman was a Manchurian candidate, someone brainwashed and primed to kill on command. 
for this conspiracy theory, Chapman's apparent mental state and the fact that he did some charity work abroad some years before the murder in an unlikely place, Beirut, a place crawling with the CIA. Against the Manchurian candidate theory, if he'd been set up to kill, he'd surely have been programmed to either kill himself or run back to his puppeteers to be disposed of. Far too dangerous for him to fall into the arms of the law, which in fact, of course, he did. Conspiracy theory number two, the doorman did it. For this theory, he was a former CIA operative who had been in on the Bay of Pigs attempt to overthrow Castro. No stranger to guns and no stranger to covert ops, his identity was supposed to have been kept secret for six years after Lennon's murder. Also, the bullets that hit Lennon hit him in the left-hand side of his back, which is exactly the spot they would have entered if the shots had come from the doorman's booth. Against. No proof whatsoever that he is the man who was a former CIA operative. If he were, though, his only possible motive would have been political. And although Lennon was certainly a thorn in the side of the American right, the incoming President Reagan was far too media savvy himself to consider Lennon a threat. As to the direction of the bullets, surely John Lennon was the kind of man who would have turned if he'd heard his name politely uttered. So maybe he was turning to the left, and hence the entry wounds. Mm. Mm. Do you know what sticks with me after doing all that research into that mm -hmm. and coming up with that? What's that? Is that, you know, like you've had an argument in the car on the way home. Yeah. If you haven't, you get out together, don't you? And you walk up the garden path together. Yeah. Don't you? Mm -hmm. Generally. Yeah. But if you've had a bit of a ding-dong, mm -hmm. then whoever's nearest the door will march to the door and go in by themselves, leaving the other one to come in a bit later. That's yeah. how it goes, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And when they got back to the apartment, I think what happened was that Lennon said, look, we're going back. And because it was Yoko's song that mm -hmm. they were mixing, yeah. walking on thin ice, mm -hmm. I think that they'd had an argument, possibly because she wanted to stay a bit longer. Yeah. But Lennon said, no, I want to get back and kiss Sean goodnight. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, I want to stay. And he said, I was going to... Mm. And so when they got back there, the car pulled up outside the building. It, you know, it could have driven in. Really? And if it had driven all the way in, because mm -hmm. there was this archway, mm -hmm. which was wide enough for a Rolls Royce. I think his car was a, a white Rolls Royce, mm -hmm. driven by his regular driver. Mm -hmm. That could have driven all the way through the arch and into a little courtyard. Right. But I don't think they could be asked with that, because it was a bit of a tight squeeze or something. Mm. So the car dropped them off on the pavement, the sidewalk, as the Americans call it, mm -hmm. outside the archway. And I think that Yoko was on the side of the car that was nearest the archway, so she just got out, closed the door, mm. and marched past the archway, because she'd already got the length of, the li of this little sort of alleyway mm. it was about 10 feet wide and turned and gone up the steps into the reception area because mm -hmm. it's like an alcove with a lift in it i guess right and he had must have got out the other side and maybe he'd had a quick word with the driver mm -hmm. who he knew i think his name was joe and then lennon what the car drives off and lennon goes round and so he's a good 15 or 20 seconds well, how long? She goes past. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. He gets out his side. Oh, I suppose about eight or nine seconds. He's mm -hmm. about eight or nine seconds behind her. But if you're a, if you're a couple yeah. and you get you go into the house that way, don't you think there's a, usually a tension? Some yeah, kind of tension? Po possibly, yeah. And this is the thing you see. You know, like you have an argument with, with, with your other half. Mm-hmm. And they go off to work or you go off to work or one of you goes to the shops or something. Mm. You know, there's always that awful thing that something might happen to them. And the last time you ever talked... Mm. There's an argument. It was an argument. Yeah. It was a bloody argument. 
and I've got nothing to go on at all except those small bare facts. But that's the one thing that stands out to me from doing that research, that maybe they'd had an argument and she stormed in, mm. you know, maybe. Yeah. And he's sort of dawdling because he got his way, but, you know, he's dawdling a bit. And then he gets himself bloody shot. Anyway, do you want to know the most ridiculous conspiracy theory, which is genuinely held by quite a few people, almost entirely Americans? Go on. There is a genuinely held belief mm -hmm. that the killer was not Mark Chapman. Right. That it was not the doorman. Right. That it was the horror novelist Stephen King. Why? <laughs> Because in one of the photographs of Mark Chapman, mm -hmm. he looks remarkably similar to Stephen King. That's the beginnings of it. Right. And then almost to demonstrate how easy it is to come up with a ludicrous conspiracy theory, if you want to, mm -hmm. these theorists have then gone on to establish that King had no alibi on the night of the moon. Oh, for goodness sake. And I'm not even going to mention the conspiracy <laughs> theories that's the theory that says that Paul McCartney did it. <laughs> I've heard that one. Not even going to mention it. Ludicrous. Mm. But as with so many of these things, you see, the wise man said it's most likely the most likely explanation, and the most likely explanation is that Mark Chapman was a was a very very unbalanced, even though he looked extremely normal. Have you seen pictures of him? No. He looks like anybody's physics teacher. Right. He's got quite a nice haircut. He's got quite a nice jumper on. Jumper. There's a jumper. <laughs> a jumper to kill John Lennon. Not, you know... You know, he's not a mess. No. You you really could imagine him at a PTA meeting. He's got those nice glasses that he wears. Spectacles. Not strange ones. Not dark glasses. Is he in prison? He's still in prison. Right. Um, and the police, when they arrived, they said, well, you, you, you can't be serious. Look, he's still here. He's standing here. Nobody's holding him. He's standing <laughs> here. Mm. How often does that happen? Still have a gun, though. I guess. That's, but that, does, that, that worries me a little bit, because why didn't the, the doorman who... OK, the doorman is 60-something. Mm. Chapman is a young man. You know, you're standing there next to a man who has just fired five shots and hit a guy in the back. Mm. What do you do at 60-something? Because you couldn't have wrestled him to the ground, I suppose. So what did they talk about? How long does it take the police to arrive? It's got to take five minutes. Well, I don't think you'd stand and make small talk. I think you would either run for cover yourself or attempt to, depending on we're where you were. Yeah, we're talking about the John Lennon murder and the conspiracy theories that uh, inevitably spring up about these. Um, I think David has emailed, I think that... The If the conspiracy theory is brilliant, it was written by someone like me, dyslexic. The only thing is he confused Lenin with Lenin. Personally, I prefer the one that says it was Yoko that set it all up because John had decided to come back to the UK. This is why he had written, it is like starting over. Come on, Chapman was a nutter, bastard. Yes, he was a nutter. It's probably as simple as that. And Paul says, um, you should speak to Karen Douglas, head of psychology at Kent University. She's contributed to an article in this month's Focus magazine about conspiracies and their attractions to the masses. That's interesting. Mm. Should we make a note of that? Yeah. Should we do that when you come back from your holiday? Yes. Peter Collins has said, uh, I worked in Ted Shepherd's bookmakers in Rookery Road, Handsworth in Birmingham for six years. Duty, including settling bets and board marking. Dare question me on my past. Don't question your past, Peter. Steady, son. I just asked which bookie you'd worked in, mate. Because <laughs> the one that I used was the big lad Brooks, right in the middle of town, OK? Um, he says, uh, and by the way, John Lennon was 40 when he got killed, not in his early 30s. So, Tommy, it helps to do some research before you make ill-informed <laughs> comments. I go, what's the matter with this guy? <laughs> what, 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 is, what on earth <laughs> is going on here? No, I expect to get banned from your show. No, but we can't be cosy liberals, can we, Peter from Birmingham? Oh, dear. Yes, it, uh, Peter, it may surprise you, but the, the age at which Lennon was shot is not central to the episode, <laughs> OK? <laughs> you know, his blood group is more significant, frankly. 
than his age, Peter. So it's a matter of knowing what's important from what isn't, Peter. Bless your cotton socks. And yes, an each way double at evens uh, gets you your money back, um, mm -hmm. Peter. You obviously were working probably in your head. Well, they use calculators now, mate. Uh, and so should you have done. Um, nice emails coming in. Thank you very much indeed for that. We're about half an hour away from Catherine Cat. Our email address is studio at playradiouk.com, skype play.radio.uk, switchboard number 01243 556060. Talking about John Lennon and his death on this day in 1980, the conspiracy theories that have sprung up there. And we're talking about conspiracy theories in general, since they're pretty much all of them extremely interesting, although we may not get to the possibility that the Queen is a lizard <laughs> this year. It's just gone 20 past nine. Good evening. Play to UK. Headlines. One of the officials at the centre of the Baby P child abuse case has been dismissed with immediate effect. Sharon Shoesmith, who was head of children's services at Haringey Council in London, had already been suspended on full pay. But a panel of councillors has decided she'll receive no compensation. The toddler died after months of abuse, despite being on the authorities' at-risk register. A Frenchman's been jailed for life for trying to kill schoolgirl Jessica, Ch Jessica Knight. The 14-year-old was walking through a park at Chorley in Lancashire listening to her iPod when she was stabbed 20 times. Police are dealing with what they describe as a disturbance at a young offender's prison in Aylesbury. Officers were called to the incident this morning and quickly cordoned off the site in Buckinghamshire. Security at Stansted Airport is under urgent review after environmental campaigners broke in. More than 50 flights were cancelled when they blocked the runway. Police have made 57 arrests. And today's been dubbed Mega Monday for online Christmas presents. More than 2 million are expected to have been bought over the net. Clayton, UK. Weather. Rain affecting southern areas of England and Wales will spread steadily southeastwards, clearing the far southeast around dawn. Otherwise, dry and clear with frost forming inland, but with scattered showers on western coasts and hills, these wintry over northern hills. Looking on to tomorrow, many areas dry and sunny but cold. Some showers on western coasts and hills, these wintry over northern hills, feeling cold in the northwesterly breeze. You're up to date on Play 2 UK. <coughs> PlayRadioUK.com, part of the Something Corporation. Here you are, sweetheart. Merry Christmas. Ah, brilliant. Thanks, Mum. Great. A yak wool jumper. You really shouldn't have. You really shouldn't have. I wish she hadn't. It's the same every year. I wish she'd just go to Universal Posters. They have a fantastic range of approved pictures of some of my favourite celebrities, all digitally signed in their own handwriting. Mum could even have got one personalised just for me. Prices start from $7.99, so don't let your loved ones down this Christmas. Just go to playradiouk.com and click on the Universal Poster banner. Are you going to give me a hand out in the kitchen then? Yes, Mum, I'll help you stuff the turkey in a minute. <laughs> Yeah, with this jumper. Right then, what was the web address? Passiononline.co.uk Oh, you would look really sexy in that. Okay, that's in the shopping cart. Imagine the fun we could have with them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've ordered something for you. Something for us. How about this for me? PassionOnline.co.uk has something for everybody with a fast, discreet delivery service, competitive pricing, and a free gift with every order for a limited time. See our massive product mix online right now. Click PassionOnline.co.uk, the world's sexiest online shop. Hey folks, want to win a brand new iPod Touch? That's right, I said brand new iPod Touch. Give yourself a chance of winning a brand new iPod Touch with something.info. You could win a brand new iPod Touch just for signing up. Join the community at something.info. Get content straight to your mobile phone and win a brand new iPod Touch. www.something.info. Ah, oh, that's better. For dating, chat and content straight to your mobile, then sign up at something.info and you'll have the chance to win an iPod Touch. Sign up now and experience something different. Tommy Boyd on Play 2 UK, the original cunning linguist. Okay, we've got um, a couple of... 
forums to plug where people are they've got the show on and they're talking amongst themselves which is i think's a good way of doing it why not uh this is i've got a skype chat through fiona shall i just read this yes go okay for this it. is a chat room for play radio uk's talk radio audience and is open to all talk genre radio fans to talk about the topics that can interest that community. There are no banned persons or topics other than the limits of free speech imposed by law. Unlike other talk genre radio chat rooms which cannot handle either criticisms nor experimental Skype chatting, there's no banning of people on this chat and then continuing to talk about them in their absence. Yeah, you do get a bit of that, don't you? Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of ca there can be a lot of cattiness. I think it's going to get better, but I would never want the edge to go from i would never want the internet to go as 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 cozy and and yet at the same time somehow distant and unreal as uh, a lot of conventional radio mm. a lot of conventional radio is so far removed from what we're really like as people yeah because those that are in charge of it don't trust ordinary people and think mm. that they need to be somehow controlled a little bit just out of interest, did you see the Comedy Awards the other night? I did. Mm. Yeah. What? I just, um No, I thought it was quite interesting, Russell Brand getting the yeah. um, award. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, why not? Uh, good for him that he got that little comment in about Jonathan Ross. Oh, I thought G Ricky Gervais in bed with George Michael was funny. <laughs> yes. That was truly... <laughs> <laughs> truly ridiculously funny wasn't it i mean it must have worked backwards because what happened was gervais found out that george michael was around and he was doing his thing so mm -hmm. he said well in that case then i want to be in bed with him okay quick get better get ricky a bed <laughs> got him a bed and now how are they going to do it how are they going to make it work mm -hmm. how's he going to work the fact that george michael <laughs> <laughs> is going to be in his acceptance speech mm. and that he's in bed with him yeah yes mm. it was funny yeah He's a genius, isn't he? He is a genius. He's up there with Chaplin and Peter Sellers, isn't he? Yeah. Anyway, so this <laughs> chat room is called Unofficial Tommy Talk. Is that the address? Um, well, yes, I guess it must be. I believe there is an age condition. This Unofficial Tommy Talk uh, Skype chat, I don't know how to plug the address for this forum, but they say this is a community of adult radio listeners under 16s ought not be joining this chat. Please do not add people against their will more than once per show. Eh? I don't get that. <laughs> Surely you shouldn't add people against their will at all. Anyway, people are free to do what they want. This is the internet. Well, no, I think you can invite people. Well, you can, I mean, like we've been sort of added to this. All right. So we can choose to leave that if we want to. All right. Or we can just keep on yeah. looking. Okay. Fine. Good. So keep up the good work. That one. This one. Uh, somebody who is anonymous, but who sends in emails on yellow background paper and in dark blue italic -y sort of writing says, Is there any point asking why you don't read my emails <laughs> out anymore? <laughs> I'll read out a previous one, which goes, I know you won't read this out, but know thyself is Aristotle or Plato or someone, isn't it, or Descartes or someone of that ilk. It's not in the Bible. It is somewhere in the Bible. I couldn't tell you where, but it's definitely in the Bible that you should know yourself. Somewhere. Uh, anyway, the emailer goes on. If you think it is, I challenge you to find it. I can't be bothered. It's really easy. You don't need to trawl through the Bible. Just go to Bible Gateway and enter Know Thyself and see what it returns. No. <laughs> no, I won't. Um, but it's probably the most universal piece of wisdom that almost certainly finds itself nestling, not only in the Bible, but I would think in the Koran um, and in what little Buddha had to say. He only wrote 12 things, Buddha, not uh, an awful lot. Uh, but he spent a long time thinking up what they were, so that lets him out of having to have an enormous book for Buddhists to thump each other with. Um, and I'm sure that Hinduism and Sikhism and Confucianism and Taoism and Shinto 
and uh, probably even good old Carlyle Gilbran, probably even Satanism, contains the notion that you should know yourself. And it's a great idea because what it means is understand yourself and why the real reason why you're saying what you're saying and the real reason why you think what you think and the real reason why you're doing what you're doing okay because so many of the shitbags on this planet who, who really screw up everybody else's lives first and then their own are the people who believe that what they're doing is for everybody else's good and born of the highest possible motives when in actual fact it's in all probability the same mishmosh of largely selfish reasons and motives that those who know thyself, know themselves, are aware of. And because they're aware of who they are and why they do what they do and why they think what they think are on the whole just a little bit nicer, a little bit kinder. And certainly a good deal more honest. So if there is a God, and you can't say there isn't, but most likely God is that little bit in many of us, if only if it was most of us, God only knows what a wonderful heaven on earth this would be if it was all of us, God is that little bit of self-awareness. Honest self-awareness. I'll shut up now. Thank you for your emails on the subject. Uh, this emailer then emails back, Fine, sweetie, be happy in your ignorance and happy peddling it. There's somebody who doesn't know themselves. Here's Harry, who's emailed in. Thank you, Harry. Harry says, I've recently found you on this internet station. I used to listen to you on talk radio. I heard you play the audio about the royal family. What got you sacked? Do you recall a chat years ago when you got a homophobic guy on? As I recall, you kept him on for quite a while. And as I remember, he called back another day. Did I dream this? If I didn't, do you have any audio of these calls? I'm afraid I don't, Harry. I've never really been one for keeping bits of stuff that are in the past. I'm just marginally more interested always in the future. But thank you for your recalls. He goes on to say, I must say I enjoy the talk on this station, Mendoza and the Sunday Roast. The freedom on here is so refreshing. I just can't abide commercial talk stations anymore. They seem to fill most of the time with inane trailers of their own station, plus the adverts and crap signature music. In some hours, I think hardly any callers are actually on the air. I appreciate on Play Radio you have important announcements, but they seem... Less of a distraction on here. Harry goes on with a bit of background. I'm 57, he says, and like to listen to your podcasts in the car as a substitute to broadcast radio. I know, I know he says this may seem like a bum-licking email, but it isn't. It's just a few of my thoughts. I have to add also that I listen to Radio 5 Live as well if I've already listened to the podcasts. I can't always listen live, but I am tonight... The death of Len was a tragic event. I believe he was just shot by Chapman, a loony, sadly. Harry finishes by saying, The Skype calls are very clear. I'll try a call on Skype one day, but feel I'll make a prat of myself. I know what it's like, Harry. You put off, don't you, getting in touch with a phone-in radio event over and over. I, I've done it a couple of times myself. And um, I have to say that actually hosting this kind of radio is a lot less nerve-wracking than calling in. So maximum respect to everybody who calls in um, <laughs> for having the, the balls to do it the first time because it does take a lot of thought and, oh, my God, come on, let's just do it then. And then you dial three-quarters of the number or you Skype three-quarters of the address and then you think to yourself, no, I'll just leave it, maybe do it tomorrow or a bit later on do that loads of times and then in the end you do do it the first time and you have the conversation and almost certainly put the phone down or log off skype or whatever and think to yourself i made such a fool of myself but the point is you've done it and that's better than anything that you've done virtually apart from shooting john lennon anything that you've done 
has to be better for you, doesn't it? Than those things you have yet to do, but hope to do. You might feel you're determined to do. You might feel you're destined to do them. Well, do them, for God's sake. We're here for such a short amount of time. Do them. Um, studio at playradiouk.com is our email address. Skype is play.radio.uk. Now, a reminder, our switchboard number is 01243 55 60 60. Tonight might be the night that you finally put a question to Catherine Catt, our lovely professional sex worker and often spokesperson for uh, the many, mainly women, but I imagine also men who work in the sex industry, and herself something of a connoisseur and aficionado of the arts. So we talked to Catherine a little bit about what she's been to see, been listening to, been watching in the world of art on her monday slot and we also talk to her a little as well about what amounts to her day job she has her own dungeon fully equipped and she has a select list i think it's probably accurate to say uh of favored clients uh the most frequently asked question to Catherine so far over the last few weeks that she's been with us is how much <laughs> Or, as it's been put, usually by a representative of one of the forums who's been asked to Skype in and ask Catherine the question, what is your tariff? Uh, and she expertly and quite understandably, just as most people don't like to discuss how much they earn, quite uh, expertly manages to sidestep the subject. But if there is a question, either about Catherine's work or about art or about sex in general that you've always wanted to either discuss with somebody who knows what they're talking about or just put to Catherine anonymously I don't mind that as long as you specify in your email it's studio at playradiouk.com playradiouk.com part of the something corporation Play 2 UK is proud to announce that Catherine Catt joins our unique schedule of talk hosts. Catherine is a world-renowned lady of the night and connoisseur of literature, opera, sculpture and performance. She joins us every Monday from 10, ready to talk about affairs of the heart and the world of art, as you would never hear anywhere else. From 10, Mondays on Play 2 UK. Building your very own world-class website couldn't be easier with Moonfruit.com's award-winning design tools. With over 4,000 fully customizable templates, Moonfruit.com's easy drag-and-drop system gets you going straight away. Plus, Moonfruit.com offers you a fantastic subscription service that includes e-commerce tools and Google AdSense, helping you to quickly make money from your website. See for yourself. Click Moonfruit.com. Create, register, host, and support your website very own world-class website today with moonfruits.com Eeny, meeny, miny, moe Catch a podcast by its toe If it squeals, let it go Then pop to play radio uk.com forward slash podcast and download another show Play radio uk.com forward slash podcast. It's like going to a library without actually having to go. Tommy Boyd on Play 2 UK, a super song of sanctity in a weird and wacky world. A weird and wacky world. It's not that wacky, I think. We're actually probably more sensible than most, but... Oh, one, two, four, three, fifty-five, sixty, sixty is the switchboard number. I'll reprise that again in just a second. It's good evening to Richard, who's, uh, called in. Hello, Richard. Oh, good evening, Tommy. Sir. Hello, how are you, all right? Very well. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, thanks. Uh, this is the first time I've uh, listened to your show tonight. Excellent. Yeah. Um, you know that uh, gentleman um, emailed in Harry, I think his name was, yeah, uh, mm. said that um, he used to listen to you on, what was it, talk radio? He did. Well, I can remember listening to you on BBC Radio 5 before it became BBC Radio 5 Live. Well, now that's going back a bit. Well done. I know, and you used to do the half-term children's programmes called Take 5. Bloody hell. Richard, I remember the... I'd forgotten that. I remember the jingle as well. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, Take 5. Do you remember... The opening morning of Radio 5? No. I don't, unfortunately. 
um, I heard something about it. Have you got the um, audio for it, please, or no? No, I haven't. It's just that I was, I mean, besides being at LBC when they started, and uh, um, at Radio 5 when they started, and also at Talk Radio when they started, um, I have very, uh, a clear, but at the same time, uh, confused memory of the first show of Radio 5, because I did a children's program that went on the air at nine o'clock in the morning and they, off to and take five, yeah, yeah. and they didn't have delay oh and i said to them that's dangerous and they said don't worry about it we're the bbc yeah and the second call that i took was from a teenage boy who told a joke and i can't remember how the joke went but it had to do with margaret thatcher and a chicken's ass oh yeah but I can't remember the gag. I can't remember it either, but um, I think I remember briefly, I was told anyway, how um, Radio 5 um, opened. You had all these children from a primary school shouting, five, four, three, two, one. Yeah. Uh, and then um, one young girl, I think about nine or ten, goes, good morning and welcome to Radio 5. And then Bruno Brooks from Radio 1 popped in. No, I don't remember that. Uh, but then again, I was getting ready for my programme, which didn't, which was the second programme on. Basically, Take 5 was on the first day, I was told, but Bruno yeah. Brooks did it that day, and his special guest was Paul Gascoigne. Well, I seem to remember it was me, and I'll tell you why I remember being on air on the opening day of Radio 5, is because... Oh. Is because I looked up just as we went on air, and we had this massive gallery, which was like a technical area, and it yeah. was absolutely full of BBC executives. My word, yeah. From the head of radio down, and there's a lot of executives at the BBC, there were about 15 or 20 of them all stood there in their suits and ties, yeah. just staring at me, who is yeah. trying to sort of communicate with children. And when you're being stared at by a, bo a bunch of serious-looking adults... <laughs> It just throws you a little bit if you're saying things to children. Do you know what I mean? I it, do, it yeah. puts the wrong sort of image in your mind. It does. Well, you've got a very good memory, young Richard. Yes, I've got to be honest. Um, I used to listen to Radio 5 um, nearly all the time. I mean, um, I can remember it, there was such a variety on there, wasn't there? On 5? Yeah, well, it was a bit of a schizophrenic... It was a bit of a... A sort of a... A jam and ham sandwich, really, because it tried to be half sport and half children. Yeah. And those two things are so sort of rather polarised that one was going to either, you know, that, that, that one of those two strands was going to knock the other one into touch. Do you think that's why Five Live shut down? Well, I think what happened was Radio 5 recognised that they had to just refine things a little bit and they decided to go with sport and current affairs as opposed to sport and children's programmes. Oh, I see. Because um, i got to be honest, even at 11 years old, I mean, I was excited about it, but even at 11 years old, I was a little bit um, surprised when I heard the format. I was thinking, hang on a second, education, sport, pop music and children, my word. Yeah. It don't work. No, it didn't, did it? No. <laughs> and the problem was, a lot of people were complaining because, I mean, with hindsight, um, you know, um, uh, listening back to some tapes that my friends had of uh, Radio 5, I mean, it sounds like a, a second Radio 1, really. Yeah, you could say, I have to say, Richard, you don't by any chance work in radio, do you? Because you obviously love it and um, and think about it an awful lot. I, it, do to, I do, to be honest. Do you? Who do you work for? Uh, GTFM. Tell me a bit about that lot. Basically, it's a local station for uh, South Wales. Okay. And it serves the Pontypridd area. And what do you do? Um, a love songs programme. A love songs programme? Oh, yeah. Outstanding. Can I, can I play you a couple of... Um, I don't, how recently have you been listening to Play Radio, Richard? Um, only um, since Friday. Since Friday. Okay. We're allowed to play things on this uh, station that you wouldn't hear anywhere else. Oh, yeah. So this is, this will make you laugh. This is oh. a, a, dis a disc jockey. Um, I think it's on Radio Leicester. 
Oh, yeah. And somebody sent him a request. And it's one of those spoof requests, but he doesn't realise that, so he reads it out as if it's real. OK, then. You ready? Yeah. OK, let's get to our first, straight away to our first dedication. Dear Chris, please say a big hello to Connie Lingus, who's 69 on Tuesday. She'll be enjoying my meat and two veg on Sunday at 12, which are all the very best, and tell her I look forward to seeing her when she comes. Thanks ever so much, says Ivan Ardon. And he says, uh, please say hello to Bill as well. And that comes from Ivan uh, going out to uh, Connie in Thurnby Lodge here in Leicestershire. I suppose you wouldn't be able to play that on your radio station, would you? No, I wouldn't. Now, you'd like to, though, wouldn't you? <laughs> oh, I would. You would. <laughs> yes. But, Funny. um... Go on. I also have done stuff for, um, another station. It's another internet station, to be honest. Oh, well, who's that? Golden Radio International. Golden Radio International? That's the one. OK, where's that... What, what's that broadcast? It's a nostalgic station, basically. And it's to kind of keep the pirate radio days alive, you know, Radio okay. Caroline and what have you. Okay, okay. Uh, what have I, I... Would you be able to play stuff like this? You see, would you like to? This is a bloke called Alan Jones. Okay. Alan Jones is a hard-nosed breakfast show host in Australia. All right. Uh, but sometimes, when he's in the recording studio, he lets rip. Oh. Here we go. Ready? All right. Commentator par excellence. Hack presents. I am the best. The closet recordings of Alan Jones. I'm the Muhammad Ali of 2UE. Find out why so many people are choosing the comfort of a waterbed from Water Brothers. Remember the name Water Brothers Waterbeds. Getting a good night's sleep. You're having a fuck on a rolling bed. That's what it's about. <laughs> oh, my dear. How do they do it? Let's go. 319-8957. Who wrote that fucking script? And if that doesn't bore people, you can tell Rob Kinney when you get it to him, I said, if that doesn't bore people witless, nothing will. Whoever wrote that ought to be given a hot knife, preferably across <laughs> the lower part of the throat. Dreadful. Written and spoken by Alan Jones for the amusement of the Triple J audience. Good stuff, isn't it, Richard? Oh, it is, yeah. Why can't we broadcast like that, mate? Why won't they let us, after 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, why won't they just let us say, you know, what's on our mind? Oh, I agree. So have you got any jingles there or no? Have I got any jingles? Oh, yeah, because I like them. You like jingles, do you? Oh, um, Well, this isn't really a jingle. I'd be most grateful for the return of the blade. Now peer up them their shambles, or I'll feed you piecemeal to the rats in the cellar. Belay your swivel tongue, purity. It were only a fitting to watch over you as any gentleman would. Not really a jingle, is it, Richard? No. What are your favourite jingles, then? Because you've done very well to remember some of the jingles from my time on Radio 5, which I'd forgotten myself. Carry on. i tell you what my favourite ones are. Yes? The ones off Radio 1 in the 80s. Yes, I can remember a few of those. Go on, you go first. Across the UK, for you and me, Britain's favourite Radio 1. Yeah, that's really good, yeah. I remember, although it doesn't take a lot of remembering... Wonderful Radio One. Oh, it's back in the 60s, that, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Ooh, Gary Davies. <laughs> what? Go into that one. Wasn't that Ooh, Gary Davies? Who's that with you? Ooh, this Gary is Fiona, Davies. Richard. Richard, say hello to Fiona. Fiona, this is Richard. Oh, hello, Fiona. Hello. Hello. How are you, all right? I'm very well, thank you. Oh, good, I'm glad. Did you listen to Radio One in the 80s then or no? I did. It was Gary Davies, wasn't it? That's the one, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, used, I went to a road show of his ones. That was nice for you, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, what other ones were there? Um, Deeply Travis. Yeah, the jingles, though. Can you remember how the jingles went? I never liked Dave Lee Travis. Nothing against him. <laughs> I never liked him because Noel Edmonds used to do Breakfast on Radio 1 and he used to do some really good um, prank calls. He did? And I enjoyed them. Mm -hmm. And Tony Blackburn used to be on before him. And Tony Blackman was a very good disc jockey. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, but Dave Lee Travis neither did prank calls, nor was he a very good disc jockey. So I didn't like Dave Lee Travis. <laughs> it was the beard, was it? A lot of people didn't like him, to be honest. A lot of people thought that he was moralistic. Moralistic? And a little bit old-fashioned. Old-fashioned. There wasn't much to his act, that was all. No. 
I mean, I liked him. I mean, I, I grew up with him, see? And I like the R tune. Or oh, Simon Beats. Mm. Oh, no, I, I, got, I got a bit fed up with that in the end, really. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, it did go on for too long, to be honest. It did, because you, you knew where it was going, didn't you, really? There were occasional ones that made you stop and think, but I think you should have reduced it to once a week. Yeah. <laughs> really. I mean, the, the trouble was, you see, I mean, it was so predictable. You yes. knew what you were going to get. And, yes. You know, the stories, oh, the doctor came and the baby died and all that kind of thing. Yes. I guess it was a bit like an early sort of um, Jeremy Kyle, wasn't it, really? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Airing your dirty linen in public. Oh, no. Jeremy Kyle used to be on Virgin, didn't he? Did he? Yes, he did, yes. Jether's Virgin Confessions. Yes. And so uh -huh. did... What's his name, the bloke who just does hypnotism now? Paul McKenna. You're good, Richard. You're very good. We, we, sh we better get a mastermind-type radio quiz for you. Let's see what I can catch you <laughs> out, shall we? Are you ready? OK, then. All right, here we go. Uh, come on, radio questions. We'll catch Richard out. Come on. Anybody listening? Anybody, anybody, email an uh, utterly, utterly obscure radio question. W Richard, do you want a um, strand on this station? I quite like this. Sorry? Radio Obscurata. Oh, that'd be good. What's what? What shall we call you, Richard? You don't own an anorak. What was I might do? So, what were the? This is very go. obscure. Here we go. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, this isn't very obscure. But come on, come be, on. There will be a second question. So, um, re recite me the opening line then, just before the launch of Radio One. Ten seconds to go before Radio 1 Tony Blackburn and Radio 2 Paul Hollingdale. Five, four, three, get tuned to Radio 1 or 2, Radio 2, Radio 1, go. Bloody hell Excellent, fuck. well done. What was Tony Blackburn's dog called? Arnold. Bloody hell, fuck. And what was the, who was the voice that did those words? Um, the voice who did the opening announcement before the first jingle, yeah? Yes. Robin Scott. Okay, okay, okay. Really? Are you sure? What? what? I am, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, what did the little boy, whose name they never found out, whose identity was never uncovered, but nevertheless became an integral part of Ed Stewpot Stewart's junior choice every Saturday morning, say? Hello, darling. Bloody hell, fire. This guy's good. Come on, come on, come on. We've got, to get, we've got to get him. We've got to get him. I don't think it was Robin Scott, though. I think you got that wrong. What? I thought it was, I thought it was Paul Hollingdale, wasn't it? No, Paul Hollingdale was on Radio 2. Paul Hollingdale came on after, see. I mean, Did Robin he? Scott was the, um, Robin Scott was uh, the controller of uh, Radio 1, so he kind of had the um, opening speech, see. What was the, what was the wavelength of uh, Radio 1? The first one? Yes. It was, uh, what's it now, um... 247. It was 247. And what did it move to? 275 yes, and 285. Yes, it did. It did. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, why was that? Why was that? Um, why, why, why the wave, why the wavelength change? I'm, I'm not exactly sure, I'm afraid. Well, don't go googling it whilst <laughs> I'm talking to you. <laughs> That's you cheating. Hear you tap, tap, tapping. Uh, we can do that. Like, a lot of people do that. They think that they, they, they're tap, tap, tapping away on the old keyboard. <laughs> no, uh, the story is that a BBC executive went to a European wavelength conference, right? And his job was to keep 247 for Radio 1, right? And the yeah. story, and I'm sure it's apocryphal, but the story is that he got pissed. Right? Oh, dear. <laughs> and forgot to put his hand up. When they said in Belgium, does anybody want 247? Oh. <laughs> right? And he woke up with a hangover in his hotel room the next morning and discovered that Radio 1 was now <laughs> 265 and two, whatever it was, 275 and 285. I'd like to believe that story. Oh, by the way, do you remember the human zoo that you did on Talk Sport? I do. I phoned into that. You did? I did. What did you do? Uh, basically, I played a clip of a band that um, I was a part of in... Because uh, I used to be a student, you see, in um, England, in Erifoot. Right. Just, um, stay, just stay, a... stay with us a second, Richard. I've got... Um, 
I think I've got a call coming in. Somebody wants to ask you a question. If that's so, then we'll have that question put to you. But because we're not investing heavily in old technology here, <laughs> our, phone th our phones can only run one at a time. So, I Fiona, just... Don't, uh, are you still there, please? Yeah, no, you stay there. I, I don't want to be rude, but I'm going to let you go now, if that's all, all right, because right, I'm, I'm a bit tired, but I'll phone back some other night, if you like. No, I'll be fine. Thank you for that. Bye-bye. OK, bye. Bye. What a nice man. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't sure at first whether he was a spoof. <laughs> <laughs> do you think he was a spoof? What do you think, Carla? Was that a spoof? Mickey Macky Moe Moe Moe. Mickey Macky Moe Moe Moe. Licky Ducky Doo, Licky Ducky Doo. Licky Ducky Doo, Licky Ducky Doo, Licky Ducky Doo. What? Licky Da, Bibba Da. Ha la ka, ha ha ha. Me caca choo choo. Oh, Lan Bato. Me, 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 big one. Mimi Doodle Popeye Ginger. Me Kakabogi. The very similitude is blowing from the sound. Spra five. Bearable six. Windy. So, uh, answers on the postcard, please. Was he real or, or not? Um, I'm not sure. Let me just uh, take a couple of. Uh, Stephen L. has Skyped in. He is on crack. I think he <laughs> means that last caller is on crack. Ty Showers emails, What is your process for submitting music for play considerations? Do you accept high-quality MP3s, Ty? Yes, Ty, we accept high-quality MP3s, low-quality MP3s, <laughs> scratchy budget-quality MP3s. And anything goes. Yes, MP3s. you can shout into a tin can, seal it up with sellotape, and send it in the post to Imperium House, Ford Lane, Yapton, West Sussex, England, Britain, Europe, the world, the solar system, the galaxy, the Milky Way, the universe. Did you used to write that in the back of your <laughs> exercise books when you were little? Yeah. And did it make you realise you were insignificant? I'm not insignificant. <laughs> We are. We <laughs> no, are I'm just teasing. Yes, yes, I, I know, know we are. I I know. Know. So why then are we so serious? Why do we take everything know. so bloody serious? I'll just take a couple more quick emails and then we'll look ahead to right after some important announcements at what we call the top of the hour in broadcasting. But nobody else does, do they? No. The only people in broadcasting who at the top of the hour. Mm. It's actually enshrined in the audio that comes <laughs> spilling from our technology here. It it's is. Top of the hour. I think yes. it's top of the hour. Yeah. Have you ever said that? I thought it said top of the pops. You said, I'll see you outside the cinema, darling. <laughs> oh, what time will you be there? At the top of the hour. <laughs> you wouldn't, would you? <laughs> no. no. I might do that. You wouldn't. Now. What time of school? You know, what time they all piss off from school? At the top of the hour. <laughs> Does that, doesn't work, does it? <laughs> what time is What time is Prime Minister's question time? That's the top of the hour. <laughs> or the bottom of the hour. You get that? Do you get hour. that? Yeah. You do. You do. You say the bottom of the hour? Mm. Yes. Yes. That's silly, isn't it? It is. <laughs> so is this conversation. <laughs> Daniel Rayner has emailed on the subject of Joey Deacon. He says, I was sitting meditating the other night and this came to me. It's time... They're all from a certain generation and sta stand up and say sorry to Joey Deacon. And on it goes. We'll read that during our private time <laughs> and see whether we can broadcast it. Thank you, though. Happy Tree says, interesting to hear about the possible inner motives for some people seemingly altruistic actions. The way I think of selfishness is this. Absolutely everything we do is ultimately selfish. We do things because they are the most acceptable action to take at the time. But acceptable to whom? To what? To ourselves and our consciences or lack of it? If every impulse, considered reaction and mixture of the two is ultimately done because we wanted to do it to satisfy our very own reasons, the judgment of whether something might be selfish or not cannot be attributed to bear motivation, but rather to the kinds of things that satisfy someone's own desire, desires, he says. So the question is, do those technically selfish desires benefit only themselves, or do they benefit themselves plus others, taking account of a wider perspective than the immediate self? 
the satisfaction of oneself is ever present and thus assumed since we never do anything that doesn't satisfy ourselves at one level or another. But that doesn't make anybody selfish, I don't think. Now, I remember when I was little, Fiona, somebody said, even if you volunteer to be burned alive at the stake so mm -hmm. that somebody else should live... Yes. Because you have volunteered, mm -hmm. then it's a selfish act. Yeah. Because you wanted to do it. Yeah. Which complicates things enormously. Yes. And you're obviously getting some... You are obviously getting some gain from doing that as well. Sonny has emailed on the Kennedy assassination. Yes, thank you. And um, we're not going to have time for all of these at the moment. Um, thank you, uh, Ty Showers, who says tar. <laughs> Ty says tar, <laughs> which is cool. Uh, on the business of how to subject, how to submit audio for us to consider playing. Uh, Harry says that he thinks Richard was genuine. And Steve Bentley says, interesting you mentioned Paul McKenna in the same conversation as Simon Bates. McKenna was part of a spoof group called the Bastard Brothers, who produced a number of radio parody tapes. Attached is a clip. I don't think it's McKenna in this case, although it is from one simple called Piss Taking. So we'll get to... Thank you, Steve, for this. There was another piece of audio that came in earlier as well. Do you remember when that yeah, was? Yeah, there it is. Flagged okay, I'll flag both of those because mm -hmm. uh, Fiona's got to Scarpa in about half an hour. <laughs> uh, you're tuned to Play. It's uh, Tommy here, Play Radio. It's Play 2. It's our talk segment. And we've got... Uh, let's have a look. It's just gone 20 to 11. Fiona's not with us. You there, Chris? Mm. Okay. And Fiona is, uh, scarpered home. Is that you, Chris? Hello. Hello, Cock, are you all right? Yes, hello, Samuel. Phil, will you turn that down, please? I'm through, this is important. What? Well, uh, uh, hello? I hello. Wish, I wish to talk to... I wish to talk to... What I was going to say was, Fiona's had a scoot, so... It's just you and me, gentle listener, um, for the last little uh, lap and a half of the show. Uh, so, a reminder, email studio at playradiouk.com. You can Skype me, play.radio.uk. Uh, switchboard, of course, is 01243. That's the code, 01243, because we're down in Sussex. And the actual number is 556060, 01243 556060. PlayRadioUK.com, part of the Something Corporation. Play 2 UK's talk shows are expanding. The Sunday Roast from 8pm, radio you won't hear anywhere else. Mondays from 8, myself, Tommy Boyd with at 10. Catherine Catt live from her dungeon. The Mistress on Art, Theatre, Opera and The Boudoir. Tuesdays, Steve Paul and Ali tell it like it is. Wednesday and Thursday, Mike Mendoza, Gadgets, Current Affairs and Life. And there's more to come. Check it out. Talk on Play 2 UK. Play 2 UK, the Tommy Boyd Show. Yeah, so this is the first time we've tried this on our talk strands on Play Radio UK on Play 2. Um, we usually have uh, at least a couple of voices. They call them in radio the first and second voice. Uh, and sometimes it's one, two and three voices. And of course there's folks such as yourself listening either on Skype or on the switchboard or emails, but <clears throat> Fiona's had to scarper this evening, scarper flow, Cockney rhyming slang. It was where the Royal Navy, Navy, I think, based itself during the Second World War, a place called scarper flow. And so Cockney rhyming slang for go became scarper. Anyway, uh, Fiona's had to scarper flow, uh, family, that's cool. Uh, so at quarter to 11, that means it's just you and me, dear listener. This email's come in from Steve, who says, interesting you mentioned, we are talking about radio earlier on, chap called Richard called from Wales who had one of those um, train spotterish uh, photographic memories about just about every moment of radio he's listened to up to the present day and for some reason Paul McKenna came into the conversation and Steve has emailed interesting you mentioned Paul McKenna in the same conversation as Simon Bates McKenna was part of a spoof group, the Bastard Brothers, who produced a number of radio parody tapes, and attached is a clip. I don't think it's McKenna in this case, though 
it's from something simply called piss taking. So let's see whether we can get this up. Bear with me. I have to save it. Where do I save it to? Bear with me. This is going to be, I suspect, something of a disaster. Uh, this file cannot be previewed because blah, blah, blah. Bear with me. Right. Upgrade to Santa Claus. <laughs> right. Normally, Fiona adroitly dances her way through moments such as this. But it's myself. So just bear with me here. Got the clip. I'm going to save that. Where do I want to save it? I want to save it to my desktop. Mm, I can do this. And we're just not the sort of people who get worried about things, are we? No. So, Simon Bates, save it to the desk's desktop. And off we go to the desktop, and here it is. Here we go. Butch and sincere, but what was the year? Simon Bastard here, and I shall be talking, I'm um, talking, and talking, up to every single vote. I crashed it, but luckily the show's recorded. Our tune this morning is all about the time Gloria Pinn left her home to go to work. All seemed well with her tortoise husband, Terry. But she knew something was wrong. As the meteorite ripped her shoulder off, she remembers how Terry's shell had lost some of its luster. The darkness of the manhole Gloria fell down reminded her of Tony's lonely dark tank. And as she starved to death in a Libyan dungeon, the left-behind dock leaf was fresh in her mind. Gloria would like Terry to know she's dead. But if she were alive, she'd love you very much and would like to play our tune for the warped BBC wanker who really writes this crap. Yes, harsh. And um, probably would have been harsher if he'd be, they'd been doing it on the internet. Well, we can go a little bit further uh, than they were allowed to, I suspect. The Bastard Brothers, who produced a number of parody, radio parody tapes. Um, if you're still listening, Steve, was that, was that broadcast? Or was that just some kind of bootleg underground thing, or maybe some alternative comedy club routine that they used to do? Because it's quite harsh, uh, and the language is quite strong, and they couldn't do it now on mainstream radio, could they? Steve adds, the story about 247 seems a bit dubious, by the way. I agree, Steve, and when I was telling it myself, I wasn't sure whether it was true. But I heard that somewhere along the line, they changed the broadcast frequencies for Radio 1 or... Yeah, I think it was Radio 1, because a BBC official fell asleep at some kind of European conference at which they were going to divvy up all the various frequencies because obviously you can broadcast on the same frequency in Latvia as they might be broadcasting on in Norway because it's unlikely that the transmitters are going to send their signals that far away, a couple of thousand miles. But if you've got a French radio station broadcasting on one wavelength and there's a British radio station broadcasting on the same wavelength, then you're going to get a little bit of crossover. So this conference was designed to make sure that didn't happen. And the story went, and probably an urban myth, that the BBC executive fell asleep and, or something or wasn't paying attention or wasn't very forceful and uh, so the BBC lost one of its cherished wavelengths. I don't know. Steve says, that story about 24-7 seems a bit dubious, by the way. Radio 3 got moved to 247 after the frequency changes. I have some audio, he says, of Radio 3 fading up Tony Blackburn for 30 seconds so their listeners would know where to tune to and put their stickers. Uh, send it to me? Yeah, go on, send it to me. So let's have a listen to this clip again. Was this ever played on national radio? Butch and sincere, but what was the year? Simon Bastard here, and I no. shall be talking, up and talking, and talking, up to every single... The best Radio I crashed it, but luckily the show's recorded. Our tune this morning is all about the time Gloria Pinn left her home to go to work. All seemed well with her tortoise husband, Terry. But she knew something was wrong. As the meteorite ripped her shoulder off, she remembers how Terry's shell had lost some of its luster. The darkness of the manhole Gloria fell down reminded her of Tony's lonely dark tank. 
man as she starved to death in a Libyan dungeon. The left behind dock leaf was fresh in her mind. Gloria would like Terry to know she's dead. But if she were alive, she'd love you very much and would like to play our tune for the warped BBC wanker who really writes this crap. Yes, I mean, clearly my question, was this ever played? Ha 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 ha, national radio. No, because bastard isn't a word that can be used or is used, I suspect, even late night on the radio. They don't have a watershed on the radio. Um, of course, the watershed would mean that strong language and intimate affairs could be discussed freely on the radio after that watershed if the watershed is used and understood properly one of the problems that television has though where they have a watershed is that whilst one is not able to say the word fuck for example before the watershed it almost becomes compulsory after the watershed if some kind of language which underlines a piece of script is available it is the word fuck and therefore the word fuck gets used so often that one almost is anaesthetized to it uh, but thank you very much indeed for that clip steve and he adds uh, an email coming in whilst we were having a second listen he says it was basically the equivalent of the christmas tapes that were passed around the tv companies but for radio intended for internal consumption only until the internet came along yeah so again, that's one of the nice things about the internet, that we can play things like that and uh, be objective about them and um, and basically enjoy. Now, somewhere this afternoon, we've got a link this evening, afternoon, evening. It's Tommy here, Tommy on his own, just you and me, good listener. Uh, Fiona's had to scarp her home, which is cool, family thing. No, no um, big panic or anything. She's there off on holiday in the morning and their youngest daughter, who had the option of staying at home because she's in a panto at 10 o'clock this evening, text to say that she's changed her mind. So uh, Fiona's got to go back to sort out paperwork and blah, 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 and all that sort of thing. And relatives who are going to look after and blah, 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 blah. So that's cool. So it's just you and me. This is a uh, subject, Iva, Ivan Brackenbury. And the message from Lee Wickstead reads, Hi, Tom. After listening to... Our local fool, Les Ross, and your enjoyment of his work. Have you listened or heard of a stand-up hospital radio comedian, Ivan Brackenbury? His show is just about the funniest I've heard in ages. Here's a YouTube link. Enjoy. So I've no idea what we've got here. But here's the link connecting. Hospital radio. With me, Ivan Brackenbury. Ivan Brackenbury. <laughs> you got me jingles. Okay, so it's a guy standing on stage. He's got a baseball cap on. Looks um, unnervingly a little bit like Timmy Mallet. Got a bright red fluorescent shirt, uh, and he is at a stand microphone. He's got one or two little props. I'm just painting the picture uh, so that you know that this is a piece of comedy, and it looks good. I'm bonkers. Peace, <laughs> yes. I am bonkers. He's bonkers. And we're live on a Monday! Tuesday! <laughs> now, this keeps happening, but I know. Wednesday! They want to do Thursday! Alright, one minute, I know how this Friday. Saturday. Saturday! Sunday! Sunday. It's another loop. 1963, 19, 1964. Happy New Year. <laughs> Keep forgetting to program it. Um, this afternoon's show is brought to you thanks to our sponsors, KY Janet. <laughs> the Ivan Breckenbury Disease Hour on Hospital Radio with KY Jelly for women who marry for money. <laughs> Get well soon. 
Hello to Alan Manford. Alan is a Jehovah's Witness and a haemophiliac, which is an unlucky combination. I happen to know he's a massive fan of Leo Lewis, and this plays next for him. a bit mental really because like um oh I don't know if I should tell you this but I will because I, I think everyone needs to know how mad the world is. I was checking into a hotel here in Edinburgh uh, for the festival and I couldn't believe my ears with what the bloke in front of me said to the receptionist. He was a youth worker checking in a youth group for a theatre theatre group and I swear to you this is what he said to the receptionist is the porn channel disabled? <laughs> oh, this is very good. Very, very, very good indeed. It's about ten, what is it, about eight, nine minutes long. So I just thought I'd uh, uh, I'd break it right there because he's, he's dropped his character as being some kind of uh, a hospital radio DJ, which worked very well. Uh, an obvious joke, wasn't it, about Love Really Hurts Without You, um, dedicated to their sponsor, KY Jelly, and the haemophiliac and the Jehovah's Witness. But hey, sometimes the obvious makes us laugh, and if we laugh, that's all that matters, isn't it, really? But now he's gone off into, I presume, a straightforward uh, stand-up comedian's routine, although he's still dressed as a as a bad disc jockey. Um, um, just after, uh, as we say in broadcasting, the top of the hour, and the ad break there. We'll just take the second half of it. Looks as though he's about to launch into a routine about um, porn for the disabled. Maybe we should get Catherine Cat back. I know it's one of her topics um, that we've been promising a special on, which is one of the services performed by sex workers for people who are disabled. And Catherine is informed by them are unable to have gratifying sex any other way than by hiring someone like her but hopefully the routine we're about to listen to after the t top of the hour our break is a little bit funnier than that um peter says good evening tommy did you know that in fact jeremy carr presents a football related phone-in now on talk sport every sunday between 12 a.m and 3 p.m and believe me it is awful radio and my advice to jeremy kyle is to stick to your day job mate well if he's on from 12 o'clock midday until three o'clock in the afternoon peter unless it gets dark very very early in london i think that is a day job <laughs> but anyway i catch your drift thank you for that um uh now we've got some more email from steve as well who's uh, getting challenging with who is it who sent in the email about the hospital radio guy hold on that's uh lee lee wickstead so thanks for that lee and we'll get to the second half of that one in just a tick and then we've got one or two more nice clips that have been emailed in from Steve Bentley. The first one he says, is this the Blackburn? The first clip he says is the Blackburn on Radio 3 clip. He says, I'm not sure it's really that interesting unless you wear an anorak. But he then says, I've got lots of further info and clips on the frequency changes here. But then he adds, just hearing the Ivan... Brackenbury mentions, I've seen him live and I hadn't laughed so much for ages. Comedy genius. He's got a show on Radio 2 in early January. Yeah, but this is the thing now. He's an edgy-ish comedian doing jokes about KY Jelly and Jehovah's Witnesses and haemophilia. But Radio 2, he's not going to be able to do any of that nowadays. I mean, who'd want to be a comedian? Going on to BBC Radio, going on to Radio 2. Now! End of 2008, beginning in 2009. When I started as a stand up, ugh, I worked for two seasons as a stand up comedian, dear listener friend. And I started telling jokes like Orange goes to a doctor. The doctor says yes. And the orange says, I'm not peeling very well. And I died. And a red coat came up to me after my first couple of deaths by silence and said, Look, mate. He said, that they're all grown up. They're not interested in light bulb jokes. 
they want hard-hitting stuff about foreigners and mother-in-laws. So I told them and it worked. And I don't know how difficult it's going to be for a comedian in this day and age when we know that we all have an edge to ourselves because we voted Russell Brand as television comedy act of the year on ITV at the same time as the BBC were saying, you can't go near any of that, mate. I'm sorry. So, um, it's you and me this evening. Fiona's had to scarper, skedaddle. Email studio at playradiouk.com. The Skype address is play.radio.uk. If you want to Skype, I'll do my best. The switchboard number 01243 55 60 60. It's talk on Play 2 on Play Radio UK. PlayRadioUK.com, part of the Something Corporation. Play 2 UK's talk shows are expanding. The Sunday Roast from 8pm, radio you won't hear anywhere else. Mondays from 8, myself, Tommy Boyd with at 10. Catherine Catt live from her dungeon. The Mistress on Art, Theatre, Opera and The Boudoir. Tuesdays, Steve, Paul and Ali tell it like it is. Wednesday and Thursday, Mike Mendoza, Gadgets, Current Affairs and Life. And there's more to come. Check it out. Talk on Play 2 UK. My mum logged on to Play Radio UK and treated herself to some amazing Swarovski jewellery from the Scarlet Jewellery. She looks a million dollars. You should see all the other mums and dads' faces when she picks me up from school. She's the classiest mum ever. She said the Scarlet Jewellery is handmade in Italy with Swarovski stones. Mum said if I'm good, she'll buy me some of the Scarlet Jewellery when I'm a bit older. Have a look for yourself. Go to playradiouk.com and click on the Scarlet Jewellery today. Live to the UK. UK. News, information, entertainment, and the best music from the past 40 years. This is Play 2 UK. Tommy Boyd. Call 01243 55 60 60. Email studio at playradiouk.com. Skype play.radio.uk. Now, live from the south coast of England, the Tommy Boyd Show, only on Play 2 UK. It's just myself with you for this last lap of the Monday show. It's December the 8th, the anniversary of the day they shot... Oh, Mark Chapman shot John Lennon. We've been talking about that tragic event and also the various conspiracy theories that have sprung up around it and conspiracy theories in general. And we will be talking about 9-11. Uh, JFK, if anybody does want to go there, and we've had one email on that this evening, but some of the other more obscure conspiracy theories there's that one that the titanic wasn't the titanic but was a sister ship that had been fatally holed below the waterline after an accident between itself and a royal navy ship uh and the inquiry found that the royal navy ship was not to blame and therefore the owners of the titanic had to stand the cost of repairing the thing and so according to the conspiracy theory and there's a couple of solid books out about this. The ship that sailed the Atlantic and hit the iceberg wasn't the Titanic. It was a ship that was destined to sink anyway. That was the idea. It was going to be sunk so that they could get the insurance back, claiming that it was an entire ship. OK, that's, there's that one, so we could discuss that one. Um, there's the obscure conspiracy theory that Star Trek, the TV series is somehow sponsored by the Ku Klux Klan, which is one that we like. There's another even more obscure conspiracy theory, which is that the former Prime Minister John Major is not John Major, never was John Major, but in fact is a smart aleck KGB spy secreted into this country at quite a, an early age, early 20s, given a fake identity and told to climb the greasy political pole and get as close to Downing Street as he possibly could in order to relay back secrets. And he got very close, didn't he? <laughs> in fact, he got into Number 10 Downing Street only to discover that the Cold War was over and there was nowhere for him to go and nothing for him to report. And all he ever wanted to do the whole time he was there was go home, drink vodka and play the balalaika. So we'll be discussing that conspiracy theory as the weeks unfold. Um, let's take a quick Skype call if I'm up to it. Yes, good evening, Chris. 
Ooh. Hello. You're all right there. You sound as though you're having a movement. I well, I have. I've been moving about a bit today. Can you hear me, Mr. Boyd? No. Shit again, Phil. The acoustics in there. You're gonna have to take that wall out when you finish cleaning that squid. Is it a stud wall or is it a a? Ah, he can hear us. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he might be able to hear us. Is it? I know you're a big fan of the... Is her a catchy, catchy cat gun? She's gone. She's got... No, uh, well, if you're going to be this a two-top, then you can tell me whether you can hear me. If it is studio quality, I'm, I'm probably frightening everybody that's uh, listening. It's studio uh, quality in terms of the audio, but I'm not convinced about the content. OK, then, hang on a second... The lazy brown fox jumped over the frog. It would, yes. wouldn't it? Is it working? Is that ah, the lazy that... brown fox jumped over the... Nah, what is that? I don't can't care. Hear it. Can't hear it. Um, I would very much like if you could facilitate this, Mr. Boy. Yeah. To speak some fat streams you got him on your, um, cal- what are they called? Them cal- Hulik? Hulik Black Packard Calculator. It, yes. Fat Steve Skyped in earlier to say that he's not going to be around this evening. Something oh, to do. Oh, yeah, on the piss again. Oh, well, yes. OK, well, I'll leave my Dutch lesson till tomorrow. OK. I was going to ask him, I'm stuck. Can you hear me? No. Oh, God, let's see. You no know, food back, Phil. There's either too much or there's none. You don't know. You don't know. Who you're addressing, do you? I'm on lesson thirteen. This is for the podcast, Mister Boyd. If you give me a minute, I'm on lesson thirteen in speak Dutch in three months. Go on then. It's that interesting. It's not Radio Five. If you want to go and listen to Radio Fucking Five, listen to it. These are my extended days. Give, give us you a know, little, give us a little, I, give us a little taste of the diary of Anne Frank, then, if you if you speak Dutch. Well, I don't speak Dutch. I'm a lesson thirteen, forty-one modal verbs. <laughs> I, I probably should have the auxiliary verbs. I reckon. I must just tell uh, you. I must just tell you. Infinity. And I will. I must just tell you when they did a Broadway version of the diary of Anne Frank, Go apparently on. it was so dull that when the Germans searched the house, the <laughs> crowd back on the, shelf. the crowd was shouting, she's in the cellar. Oh, no. <laughs> anyway, carry on. Steve, never was next door to her, did I? I don't know. I- I'm going to bring a caller in here and try and just spice it all <laughs> up. Find out if they speak Dutch, Tom. All right, stay there. Hello, caller, on line three. You're through. You're on talk on play two. Do you speak Dutch? Hello? Hello? No, I do not. Hello, is that Chris? Hello, Eddie. Hello, hello. hello. how are you, Chris? Jenny. Good evening, Jenny. Good, good evening, Chris. How are you? I'm very well. Uh, Birmingham uh, is uh, all right tonight. How is your arable Ends. land up there, son? It's all right. I tell you what we can do. We can do with, with a few more farmers in this urban landscape we have. I was, I was going to say, are you at all worried about this Irish pork scenario? Shitting myself. Absolutely shitting. No, full enough. It's the first I've heard about it to tell you the truth. Is it? I don't know, what is it, a pork? Pork, you say? Pork, yes. Swine? Well, I have a theory. Okay. Wait, Tell I have Chubber. a theory. Well, the thing is, right, if you if you look at the Irish uh, uh, exports uh, over the years, I mean, they're all a bit ropey. I mean, when was it, you know, if you're going to buy a laptop at the side of the road out of something Who in the make van, the best rope? The Birmingham Hemp Irish. Corporation. Well, I say they're generally Irish people selling laptops out of vans and cameras and the like. And I, I, I think they've been pumping their pork full of growth hormone because I think the Irish are a short uh, race on the whole. They had more, they had more uh, varieties of pig than we used to have. They did away with them, you know, so they could help the Danish. 
That's it's like BSD heard. all over again. I mean, the funny thing is, you know, the government are a bit worried about, like, a bit of carcinogenic uh, chemical in a bit of pork, yeah? Yeah, I don't see I them like running to whip the... Uh, I don't see them running to whip the Benson and Edges off the shelves, do you? Don't know, they got all those pictures of people with their throats hanging out on the side of the fags, I they? know, I've got one here, I've got one here. I mean, like, it's disturbing. It ain't stopping me, but it's like a red beard, this chap. Propensity and propinquity, isn't it? I don't know what it is. We might die of it, but we might get run over a bus, so we might as well have a fag. Have you seen the one with the chap with a lump on his throat? No, I haven't, so I'm going to stay out. Yeah, everybody else has, and they come round and tell me, uh, Johnny, well, promise you. It's... I said, well, I don't want to know. I got, I got my juicy freeze here, that's why I wanted to have a word with Fat Steve. See if he well, knows whether it's cheap. Anyway, all right, that's all by the by. But uh, Rokin <laughs> Bruce has got very stubborn, ran the bloody blood, and out and flat and bloody your heart. But you probably I, I, know I, I, exactly what that means. It's whatever, I know. He needs a whiskey shake. Do you have I, a fag, do you, Red Wardo? Who? Oh, fuck it, I keep blowing his cover there, do That's me, XMI5, and I blow everybody's cover. Chris, you've been uh, a poor slave lately. Thank they are the pig markets. <laughs> Quiet is <laughs> silence in the pig markets. <laughs> oh, bloody hell! He's got some tears. Well, I don't know what's going on. I think we're being unheld. I'm highly flattered if this is we're taking over the show, you know, Eduardo. Oh, I don't know. I, it's nice. I mean, I was in Port Slade today. Okay. Have you been there? What, mate? I've been in Port Slade. Port Slade? Yeah, I was there a day, and you know what happened? Oh, yeah. Oh, I sure. go there about once a month, right? Yeah. And the fucking railway crossing thing is always down, and it was down again. Can't help but moan you, can you? <laughs> Do you think they, that they've put a sensor in my car or something? Are you back home now? I'd bash as they are, poor Slade. <laughs> <laughs> He's a pig smuggler! I tell you what, I know somebody who was into... He was called Piggy Davis, but that's another... Anyway, what do you want to Piggy talk Dave? to me? I want to talk to Tammy. I yeah, wanted I him wanted, to get a I Dutch did. lesson. I've like, had enough of you, because you're very... I know. Good. Well, look, I, don't want to, I wanted to talk to Cat, because I wanted to know, right? Everybody's oh, going yeah. to watch your tariff, how much is it, and all this. You know, the simple questions, the easy questions. I wondered but if I there were any pictures know. of Go the on. lady... I didn't know that. Everyone wants pictures of Catherine. Beautiful cat. Anyway, what I wanted to ask her, because she has such a lovely voice, and she's uh, so articulate and uh, and all that. Is, oh, what I wanted to ask her is, never mind the tariff, whatever the tariff is, can you hear me? Yes. Whatever the tariff is, I would like to know if she charged a little bit extra for that you know, the naughty talk. And as you say, Tom, I'm, I'm with you very much when you say, oh, you know, we should express ourselves with our full choice or... Anyway, it's all that. Fucking hard. Thanks. Are you not over my candles, sweetheart? And I just wondered, when she has a woman in the pocket, and they agree, and like, oh, whatever happens between them, she takes control, and the people who are strapped to the wall and have all terrible stuff done to them, I just wondered if it's like almost straighty, what's she call it, vanilla sex, I can't remember. Yes, they call it, just, if you just want to lie on top of somebody, and... Right. Uh, uh, and to have sex like that, then that's vanilla sex. <laughs> right. Vanilla sex. Tommy? Yes? Can I ask a question? Because I really only called up because I got a new headset, and, I, and, I, and I'm calling you, right, not on the Skype, but from the telephone number. Yes, you are. So, like, through BT, from Skype, through headset. How does it sound? Pretty good, but nothing special. Bang on to me, uh, Johnny. 
I want it to be like, I, like you said, like we were there in the studio almost. with you. No, you can't do that using the old technology of telephones. But so Skype. I Skype you then? Yes, I'd rather you Skyped. Makes us all sound like we're having a shit, especially if we think we're going to get caught up, eh, uh, John? It does when if you we start... we know we're all right for a minute or two it, before the weather... It depends, on whether, you, it depends on whether you start off groaning in the way that you did, uh, Chris. But thank you very much Who indeed. Me? Yes, you. But oh, thank you very... Drunk. Yeah. But I thank... never asked. No, I don't wait, John. Come Just on. Let it lie. And we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you very much indeed for your wisdom. I know, I never, asked, I never got the points across. I don't know why I had this, I don't know how this works. The point was, does she <laughs> charge extra? For? I don't care how much she charges. Does she charge extra for yeah. talking dirty? Uh, well, I'll ask her next week. Well, yeah, but I was going to ask her if you were fucking sorted, sorted the buttons in. I was around before and nobody's here to help me with lesson 13, my modal valve. Ah, oh, so we're going to the bandwidth, he says. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you too, caller with the new headset. Johnny Arzen, Farzan's my name. Johnny Arzen, Farzan, thank you very much indeed. It's playradiouk.com. It's Play 2. It's our talk segment, and this evening it's just with myself, Tommy Boyd, and you, dear listener. Uh, Fiona's had to skedaddle home to deal with a nice one, a nice, uh, it was not a family problem at all, it's a nice turn up in the, uh, in the family department. Let's grab the news. Play to UK. Headlines. One of the officials at the centre of the Baby P child abuse case has been dismissed. Sharon Shoesmith, head of the children's services at Haringey Council in London, has already been suspended on full pay, but a panel of councillors have decided that she'll receive no compensation. The toddler, of course, died after months of abuse, despite being on the authorities' at-risk register. A Frenchman's been jailed for life for trying to kill schoolgirl Jessica Knight. Police are dealing with what they describe as a disturbance at a young offender's prison in Aylesbury. Do you know I'm getting the intonation right here? Officers were called to the incident this morning and quickly cordoned off the site in Buckinghamshire. Security at Stansted Airport is under urgent review. That's a drop of the voice there, just to... After environmental campaigners broke in, more than 50 flights were cancelled when they blocked the runway. Police have made 57 arrests, and a slightly lighter one. And today's being dubbed Mega Monday for online Christmas presents. More than 2 million are expected to be bought over the net. Clayton UK. Weather. Rain affecting southern areas of England and Wales will spread steadily southeastwards, clearing the far southeast around dawn, otherwise dry and clear, with frost forming inland. Tomorrow, Tuesday, many areas dry and sunny but cold. Some showers on western coasts and hills, these wintry over northern hills, feeling cold in the northwesterly breeze. You're up to date on Play 2 UK. <coughs> PlayRadioUK.com, part of the Something Corporation. Here you are, sweetheart. Merry Christmas. Ah, brilliant. Thanks, Mum. Great. A yak wool jumper. You really shouldn't have. You really shouldn't have. I wish she hadn't. It's the same every year. I wish you'd just go to Universal Posters. They have a fantastic range of approved pictures of some of my favourite celebrities, all digitally signed in their own handwriting. Mum could even have got one personalised just for me. Prices start from $7.99, so don't let your loved ones down this Christmas. Just go to playradiouk.com and click on the Universal Poster banner. Are you going to give me a hand out of the kitchen then? Yes, Mum, I'll help you stuff the turkey in a minute. <laughs> Yeah, with this jumper. Right then, what was the web address? Passiononline.co.uk Oh, you would look really sexy in that. Okay, that's in the shopping cart. Imagine the fun we could have with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, I've ordered something for you. Something for us. How about this for me? PassionOnline.co.uk has something for everybody with a fast, discreet delivery service, competitive pricing, and a free gift with every order for a limited time. See our massive product mix online right now. Click PassionOnline.co.uk, the world's sexiest online shop. The soundtrack to your festive season. Play Christmas UK. 
Ho, ho, ho. Hello, boys and girls. Santa here. Pipe down, Rudolph. Ho, ho, ho. As you can tell, Christmas in the Claus household is well and truly underway. As with any family, it's a busy time for us too. And sometimes things can get a little heated, with Mrs. Claus always wanting to listen to Play Rock. When all I want to listen to is my favourite festive songs on Play Christmas. Nothing but the season's music from the Play Radio Network. Now, where did I put that eggnog? Play Christmas UK. Part of the PlayRadioUK.com network. Tommy Boys on Play 2 UK. The original cunning linguist. Steve Bentley has emailed in a link to a piece of comedy by a man called Ivan... Brackenbury. We were talking earlier with a man called Richard, a remarkable youngish Welshman whose virtual total recall of anything he's ever heard on the radio since Tony Blackburn and Paul Hollingdale launched Radio 1 and 2 in, was it 1967? Anyway, um, Steve has emailed in a link to a guy called Ivan Brackenbury, a really funny stage comedian, alternative obviously, uh, he's got his own show coming up on Radio 2, no doubt a uh, pretty milky version of what he does on stage. Um, the first half of his act, which we've just listened to, is Ivan having a go at being a hospital radio disc jockey. Uh, part of his show is sponsored by KY Jelly, and the song into it is Love Really Hurts Without You. Ho, ho, ho. But he does it well. Uh, and in the second bit of his act, which is about three minutes long, which we're about to hear now, um, he's just launched into a story about the fact that he checked into a hotel at Edinburgh. It's part of the festival. And there was a, a group, a youth group, in front of him checking in. And the guy in charge asked if the porn channel was disabled. <laughs> If you love your country music, you're going to love the next show on Hospital Radio, Joan Arkwright's Country Tracks. It's an absolutely amazing show. And uh, she's a lovely lady and an amazing broadcaster as well. And she probably won't thank me for saying this, but she's been off with a vaginal prolapse. And, um, <laughs> and we've really missed her. We've really missed her. Joan Arkwright's Country Tracks on After This Show on Hospital Radio. Joan Arkwright's Country Tracks. <laughs> He says, uh, Dear Ivan, I've been in bed all week with Mrs. A. <laughs> oh my god! Mrs. A! <laughs> How cheeky is that? <laughs> she sounds like a right man eater, doesn't she? Mrs. A! <laughs> Unbelievable! <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I've, I've misread it. Um, he, he's been in bed all week. With MRSA. <laughs> yeah. Someone's not put the dots in. <laughs> Hello to Ashley Ward, enjoying the hospital at the moment. He's enjoying it because normally he's in prison. He is 18 years old. Last year he was done for perjury and now he has to share a cell with another man who insists on having the top bunk. And he wets the bed. <laughs> this is for Ashley on Hospital Road. No, not bad. I'm just going to listen to the first ten seconds again because I do like. He was struggling with the Ivan jingles. Ivan Brackenbury. Ivan Brackenbury. <laughs> you got me jingles, and I'm bonkers. <laughs> He's bonkers. 
I am bonkers. He's bonkers. Oh, we're live on a Monday. Tuesday. <laughs> uh, this keeps happening, but I know. Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay. They're one of them. Thursday. <laughs> I know how this is. Saturday. 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 Monday. 1961. 1961. Very good. Right. Who have we got? Is it Oscar there? Uh, hang on. Yes, it is. But I just need to do that because. This is what happens with my Skype. You can hear me all right, can you, Tom? Yep, very well. What, 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 what is it happens with your Skype? Um, well, since I downloaded the latest update, it automatically mutes my voice in my own headphones when I make or receive a call. And I have to manually click it back so that I can hear my own voice in the mix that's in my own headphones, which I like to do. It's interesting because it's so often the case with technology... Once we learn how we can compensate for its idiosyncrasies, that's fine. But surely it's not supposed to do that, or is it? Well, I think the thinking behind it is the way most people are going to use it, that it's better because there's going to be less chance of the feedback happening if it automatically mutes people's microphones. Most people, I guess, if they've got the headset, the, the, the sound in their own head, uh, uh, earpieces is not that loud. Mm -hmm just loud enough for them to hear the audio coming back from the other person mm. and they're not so used to hearing their own voice in the headphones mm. um which is something that i like to do so maybe i'm a little bit unusual <laughs> in well, that sense uh, I like this, to this, this may not be true but since you mentioned that this may not be true i'm about to say but somebody who appeared to know what he's talking about told me it the reason that the vast majority of people shout into their mobile phones he said, is because, but they don't shout into landline phones, is because when you're listening on a landline phone and talking, half of what you say is relayed back into the earpiece so that you can hear yourself. But because that would drain the power in a mobile phone, the earpiece on a mobile phone doesn't carry any of what you're saying when you speak to somebody else. So, unconsciously, people who are brought up on landlines where they can hear themselves in their own earpiece shout into mobile phones because they think that they're not coming across. Do you know what I'm talking about here? Yeah, I do. Uh, and that, that is true, what I was going to say. You know, on a normal phone, you can hear yourself in your own earpiece, can't you? As you speak, your own voice is relayed back to you. On a normal landline phone, yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, it's just a, a minor point. I wanted to uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the current situation that you find yourself in, but an, an incidental question, perhaps, before I do that. Um, I wonder if there's any, any thoughts down at Play Radio Towers of having a word with or perhaps inviting in a certain Mr. Alex Dyke, yeah. Seeing as how he's um, apparently no longer uh, doing his, his phone-ins and, and his music shows on, on the Isle of Wight uh, radio thing, I was wondering whether if he's sort of local enough or yeah. the sort of person that might be uh, yeah, someone to, who would yeah. be interesting to invite yeah. in at some point. Yeah, we're talking to Alex. You are? I'd love him to come and do some things here. I think he's great. No, I thought it was an idea because... Um, supposedly known for sometimes controversial phone-ins, although his phone-in, I think, used to just be like one hour of what was otherwise a normal music show, I think, wasn't it? And uh, he's apparently been let go, hasn't he? They, were, they said they weren't going to renew his contract at the end of the year, and uh, then they, he had the usual thing of being hauled into the office the other day and was told that, that, that the show that you've just done, I'm afraid that was your last show. They don't seem to give people even the chance to say their goodbyes when they're, kind of, when they're anticipating that they might get a chance to say their goodbyes on what they think is going to be their last show. That one never materialises. They get cut short by a, yeah. a few days or a few weeks or something. Yeah, but, uh, that, that's because of the, the, the um, almost always ill-founded fear that the, that the presenter or host, whatever you call them in question, is going to say something they'd find embarrassing. That's mm. um, yeah. disappointing, but then 
uh, the decisions that they're making with regard to interesting radio is, is also disappointing. So I would be happy to go on record and say that practically everything about the people who behave in this way is disappointing. The decisions that they make and the ways in which they execute them. And I would be absolutely delighted, delighted to hear from any of the suits, executives, people who are responsible um, for imposing this kind of anodyne diarrhoea on the airwaves. I would be delighted, I would love it if any of them could momentarily justify, just in, in any cultural way, what it is they're doing, and they can't, and they won't, but they can't, they can't, and the reason they can't is because they're only doing it because they have poxy little jobs, and they're being told by slightly less poxy people, slightly higher up the food chain, that this is what they have to do, and it's, it's, it's a joke, and it's one of the, it's one of, it's one of only a few things that this country should be ashamed of, that, that all this is happening at the moment to our radio, that there is this climate of fear in places where they used to say, say words like fuck, um, and this, dr this massive drive towards incredible mediocrity, unbelievable mediocrity, mind-numbing mediocrity. I'm glad I don't drive more than about 20 minutes a day now, because I like to listen to the radio, but as I pip, pip, pip along the dial, I just can't find anything that doesn't make me think that I'm living in a Stalinist country with the kind of controls and, you know, absolute absence of anything interesting, provoking, provocative, different, different. There's nothing different. And yeah. I, I think if I drove for a living, I don't know what I'd do. Because <laughs> you can listen to CDs for only a certain amount of the time. You want some company. Sure. You know, you want an interesting person coming out of your dashboard. Oh, well, it hard. sounds like an, an interesting throwing down of the gauntlet, Tommy, to, to say to anyone out there who's a, a, a radio executive or a senior person in, in the field of radio, whether it be regulation or management of the radio stations, let's hear some of you, because I know those kind of people are going to be listening to these sort of broadcasts, whether it be live or on the podcast, let's hear some of you have the balls to come on one of these programs and explain why it is you've made such a major cock-up of the industry that is supposed to be out there entertaining us and... And stimulating. And yes, and being a part of the infrastructure of our society. And yet it's so yeah, provide, bland and dull and provide, boring. Providing and us with a wide range of people. I mean, the, uh, I'm astonished now that almost everybody on the radio appears to be, have been punched out of the same mould. Um, on most of the commercial radio stations, which are getting by on a shoestring, um, it's kids who live at home with their mums, who've never been kissed, who don't know anything about the world, chirping away in between every third record and tra trailing ahead to the fact that there's the travel coming up. Um, and if you do have a, a station that allows or is required to, and therefore that they grudgingly have it happen, a, an element of speech or talk or whatever, um, it, it the word has gone out. Be careful. Do not take any risks. Do not say anything with any colour or vigour or, or sincerity or emotion or passion. Bleed all of those things out of what you're saying. For fear of what? For fear that somebody, one of the Green Ink Brigade, will write a letter and it'll get to an organisation who depend on getting complaints so that they can justify their existence and their salary by occasionally taking some disproportionate and swinging overreaction against a radio station that, oh, does cross the line. Some do from time to time. So what? We all park on double yellow lines, you know? We, we all occasionally say things down the phone we don't mean because we're fed up with the organisation that we're dealing with because it's driving us up the wall. So we all cross the line, but not in radio, not anymore. No, 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 no more and not for the foreseeable future as well. But hey, listen, Oscar, you and I know that that's not going to happen. Uh, people from conventional radio still think that they are, their industry is superior to new media. 
Mm. And so they don't want to dignify new media by appearing on it. Secondly, they, they think they might be in trouble with the suits further up the, high, up the food chain if they came on and said who they were. Even if they right. were trying to defend their, their organisations, they would be told by their bosses that, 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 that they should have sought permission first because it is that kind of a Stalinist industry at the moment. And if they were to justify it, they would say, oh, look, it's my job. That's what I've got to do. I've got two kids at school. I've got to pay for them. Um, and they would also say, of course... Well, the public listen. We put on bland radio and the public listen. And if that's what they want, that's what we're going to give them. And the truth is that when odd occasionally a radio station tries to do something different, it doesn't rate its arse off. So maybe, Oscar, the public is to blame to a certain extent. <laughs> yeah, I've got a lot of sympathy with that, actually. You, you say that, um, I mean, the, the public... It's tempting to, to, to come to the conclusion that the public are so stupid that do they deserve people out there making an effort to put out some good radio? But, of course, the, the people who are interested in radio from their own point of view, just to, for the for the benefit of, of themselves, in a way, to, to feel that they're being creative and producing something that's different and that might stimulate and interest people that uh, people tend to want to do it anyway and then you do i suppose you, you hope then that there will be an uptake in due course that people will uh, over the course of time realize that the the more inventive and uh, unusual ways of doing things can often be the best mm. i mean speaking of which i mentioned about this i think on one of the very earliest broadcasts that you did on on play about uh, talk 107 and i know there are a good few hundred miles up north of of where uh, Play Radio are and where I am, up in Edinburgh in, in the capital of Scotland, but um, we're sp speaking about what a mess people make of radio. I mean, what on earth is going on there, Tommy? <laughs> what? I mean, okay, it's are you TV yeah. a bunch of idiots or what? Yeah. Because yeah. you've got a, a fantastic o opportunity there, a talk radio station, which is unusual because it's in amongst a lot of music radio stations, in the capital of a nation, which is likely to become an independent nation if, if the trends continue as they've been going over the last few years. So why on earth, on an, on an FM frequency in a wonderful area like that, why can a radio group like UTV not find a talent who are able to put together a plan to manage something as wonderful as a, as a news and talk radio station in, in Edinburgh, in Scotland, and they've made such a hash of it over the, over the couple of years or so that they've had it, trying a little bit of this and a little bit of that without a clue of what they're doing, and bumbling and stumbling, and then the latest kind of change that they've made, supposedly having listened to focus groups, and focus groups can have their use, but my God, if you, if you interpret focus groups in the wrong way, obviously it can send you way off course. And what you've got now with with Talk 107 in Edinburgh is that the, the latest guy who UTV put in place there as the management has, has come up with these brilliant ideas and of course it's gone from bad to worse and the thing's now kind of up for sale there and well we don't know we, but it's a valuable license is it, how, much are they in, selling in, it, how much are they selling it for then? well yeah. I mean they haven't said as it, as it stands at the moment it makes such a loss month on month, that it's not really worth anything, that you would want them to pay you to take it off their hands. Well, you know, there because have been radio stations going for a pound. Well, oh, no, this I'm... one, that's the sort of thing that you would anticipate that it would be. Uh, but, yeah. of course, if you went and asked them and said, well, I'll give you a pound for it and I'll take it off your hands, and then obviously the ongoing debts, the month-by-month -month debts, they, they offload that. Mm. But they probably wouldn't want to do that. They say, well, no, it's a valuable license. Well, if it's a valuable license and you're a radio group that is in the business of owning valuable licenses, why can you not make a success of a wonderful one that you've got there? That doesn't mm -hmm. say very much about your competence as a radio group, does it? Mm. That you can't find anyone who can run it. Nope. And, of course, what they've done there is they've gone into this... Well, first of all, a talk radio station that has sacked all its callers than about sacking presenters. But how can you have a talk radio station that says, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's ditch all the callers. Let's not bother with them. Yeah, how brainless is that? Sorry, you're ahead of me. What have they done? I don't know anything about well, this. 
Well, nice job, UTV. Very clever. Let's have a talk radio station and let's all talk amongst ourselves in the studio. What, you mean they don't talk, they don't take calls anymore? Well, the, the format now does not really encourage, they'll mention the number and this, but they don't get any calls. And of course, when you don't get any calls, then other people don't, don't really feel calls. like that they have a place so calling. what are they trying to do? They're trying to sound like Radio 4 or something, with lots of interviews and experts yes, and guests and authors? I mean, that's the, the only good thing that I would say about it is that they've said, well, let's try and keep it humorous rather than being all the serious, which I think is a, one of the mistakes, although it's debatable whether it's a mistake, it's one of those things that seems to be swings and roundabouts a bit with uh, LBC, where they went from the, the chrysalis was more light-hearted and the global now uh, are more serious news talk, topical, and, and the, mm. the more zany callers are discouraged. But up there they've said, well, let's try and keep the, the chat fun, so some of the presenters will joke amongst themselves. But it is very much talking amongst themselves. With, with a couple of, uh, practically all the shows are double headers, and they have the news people coming in doing bits and bobs, and it, it is that kind of, what I've heard you say in the past is more what you would call speech radio rather than talk radio, yeah. where the discussion is internal, and when you shut off, it was building slowly, admittedly not to the same degree that they would perhaps have expected. Mm. They weren't getting the, the, the level of calls that perhaps they might have anticipated, but they were getting callers on most of the shows, but that was all kind of gone out of the window, and it was sort of back to the drawing board with an idea which was a heck of a lot worse than what they were developing prior to the changes. Okay, listen, so you stay right where you are, Oscar, for the moment. Uh, it's just yep. gone 22, 12, that is, midday, uh, midday, midnight in the UK. Good day around the world. Uh, hi, if you're podcasting. We'll do this, and then we'll be back talking a little bit more about radio. Of the Something Corporation. If you want to increase your profits, go the extra mile for your customers, and bring loyalty to your business, then you need Play in Store, in house or online. Play in Store is your personal, made to measure music and marketing tool. Using the latest technologies, you can create your own tailor made music and messaging service, which until now has been unaffordable to everyone but the biggest businesses. Get more from your business by creating your own radio station. Go to playinstore.co.uk Ever imagined yourself behind the wheel of a Ferrari, Aston Martin or Lamborghini? We'll turn it into a reality with an everyman driving experience. Take control of a Mini from £30, a Ferrari from £75 or try the Audi R8 Thrill Experience from £99. We can also offer that extra special gift this Christmas with one of our driving experience vouchers. For more details or to book, call the company with 25 years in the business. Everyman driving experiences on 01 455 841 670 or go to www.everymanracing.co.uk your driving adventure starts here after that someone special well you could always try speed dating so why well, you ended up burying her in the garden but that's when people started calling me michelle and of course the smell of cats that goes after an hour or you could try something different. Every day, more and more people are getting hooked up. See what all the fuss is about. Go to www.something.info. Something. Tommy Boyd on Play 2 UK. A super song of sanctity in a weird and wacky world. Just before we go back to it, Oscar, I have to apologise to Tamsin, um, who has emailed to say that um, she has sent in... Uh, two emails earlier, which didn't get read out, and that's true. But Tamsin, I'm sorry, that was only because they were, it was just an oversight, because uh, they've been coming in this evening. And I always, uh, Tamsin's are good emails. They're all good, but Tamsin's, put a bit of thought into them. So I, I usually put them in my back pocket. Uh, but Tamsin's told me off because she sent in two, and she says they're not aired. I guess they were not good enough, and I don't quite fit into your programmes now. It's not true, Tamsin. Don't overreact here. She says, I may try harder or know my limit. I hear, don't stay with this because there's a good punchline. She says, I hear you talking about the radio wasteland now. I still find occasional inspired listening out there. There is the Today program. I love it in the mornings and it often affects the news for the day. And I have to say that we do have some very good local radio and there is only a fucking eight weeks before the return of Jonathan Ross. <laughs> Which is funny, terms in. And that's why we like your emails. Thank you, mate. Oscar, where were we? 
Well, we're just talking about Talk 107 and the yeah. state that that's in. I don't know if you fancy buying it, Tommy, but some, someone with some gumption really needs to get in there and take it off the idiots that are UTV well, and I the fool it, that they put in there to manage it yeah. when, when it made his last changes. And he's talking about trying to organize a management buyout. Well, I hope if he's thinking of doing a management buyout that he's got some idea of, of changing it in, in, in a better way if he manages to succeed to get the backing to buy it out. Because, and then it, if he's going to buy it out and try and keep it going, you'd have to ask yourself, well, if he's going to change it, well, why didn't he change it while he's working for UTV yeah, as, well, as a manager may, of that you know, particular well, station? You know, he may have been under restraint from UTV. That is a possibility. It could be that the people at UTV don't know how to program cheaply and effectively a radio station which talks. Mm. Um, but I'm lucky enough to have been dispatched to america to spend time and study what they're doing with their talk radio which is fantastic and came away knowing and understanding the science and the um and the, and the, and the thought and the care and the creativity and and damn it the love that they put into talking but then you see american for americans talking is is easy they're comfortable talking almost every american mm. is a potential broadcaster they exercise interesting and vigorous ideas, and they articulate them with, uh, with style and, and with and with passion and with strength. Um, they're natural communicators. They're 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 not afraid of being heard. They're not afraid of being seen. Uh, whereas there is something about it has to be said the English, particularly in the south of England, uh, who are very cautious about expressing themselves, and particularly nervous about being on the radio. And so there is a challenge, what I've found from having done national phone-in radio, there is a challenge about doing phone-in radio in certain parts of the country. It's more difficult in the south of England, and I suspect it's more difficult in the east of Scotland. I think in the west of Scotland, in Glasgow, in places like Newcastle, Manchester, Liverpool, and to a lesser extent, but nevertheless, I will include Birmingham, it's quite easy because for some reason that I don't understand... And you're an intelligent person, Oscar. I'd love to get your reaction to this, this uh, insight. It does seem to me that there are parts of England where you're unlikely to get a hot switchboard. And they mm -hmm. are the south of England, and in particular Kent and Surrey. And in Scotland, over on the Edinburgh side of things. So maybe that's not a great place for the radio authority, or Ofcom as it is now, to find out whether the commercial sector can sustain a commercial talk radio station. Maybe they should have put it in Glasgow. or. Um, well, I heard, I heard that argument said about Talk 107 that it was on the wrong side of Scotland, but I, I find it a little bit hard to believe. Yes, culturally there may be some slight differences, but I think once you, once you get conversations flowing, then people do want to join in. There definitely is more of a, of a shyness on the eastern side there, but... I mean, in the south and the southeast, there was a time, wasn't there, when BBC Southern Counties Radio was all talk all the time. I'm sure you remember that. And I thought that at the time it wasn't too bad, was it? And it seemed I to was sustain. Speech, and I, I, do, I do. Sorry to interrupt you, but I yeah. do adhere very strongly to the distinction between speech and talk. Um, and it was again when I was in the states. What I was told about the history of of their talk radio is as follows: once the big chains had bought up all the music radio stations that were available the only stations that they could buy were speech stations which were almost like public service stations in the middle of nowhere so they bought one they bought one and decided to take it to pieces to see how it worked or didn't work and what they discovered was a radio station that was first of all top heavy with staff because the breakfast show would have two presenters a sports jock a newsreader a producer two researchers a tech op and somebody hanging around to make the coffee. They'd also be highly budgeted because they would have to have guests. Those guests would have to have taxis. Sometimes they'd have to have hotels. Sometimes the guests would actually want paying to come on. So what they did was they said, right, get rid of all of that. So they sacked all these speech people, and they brought in a few old, drunken disc jockeys who had hit 50, and it didn't quite sound right anymore to have them introducing Bruce Springsteen or whatever. These people were craggy-voiced, craggy-faced, craggy people. And they were... They had attitude. And 
they knew how to hold centre stage in a rock and roll type way. So what they were told was, do rock and roll, but without the songs, because you're not allowed to play any, because you've got a speech licence. So they got rid of all the researchers and the producers and the uh, tech ops and all the rest of it, and they got rid of all the experts, they got rid of the guests, they got rid of the authors who would come on air for half an hour just because they'd written a book. They got rid of them all. And instead of talking about politics and gardening and car maintenance and some guy's written a book because he's climbed, climbed the Matterhorn, instead of doing any of that shite, they talked about the things that people care about, which is the things that make them angry and passionate. They talked about love. They talked about life. They talked about friendships. They talked about their pets. They talked about the problems of of modern life. The subjects that you get in songs and they did them in a kind of a rock and roll way and what they've re ended up with within the united states is a type of radio that's more popular than music because they've attacked it intelligently and they've attacked it with respect for the audience because it is about the things that the audience is interested in and i'm afraid that the people who get themselves into important positions in british radio don't trust the great unwashed British public enough to want to hear what they have to say, to want to have conversations on their radio stations about the things that the British people are interested in or care about. They feel that it's somehow base and they want to somehow feel that they're part of an elevated artistic business and of course they're not. They're part of a business that's going to the dogs, going to the war, losing money. And ain't going to work. And that's, as Forrest Gump says, all I have to say about that. Mm, well, it's, it's interesting you talk about the United States as well. It brings me to something I was going to talk to you about um, regarding the situation you find yourself in, sitting there on your own now, without, without even a producer. And I think that's kind of interesting as well, because I know when I'm listening to talk radio, in, in a way, the more people that there are in the studio, in a sense the less I feel that the presenter is talking to me, yes, the listener. Yes, 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 totally, utterly agree with you, totally. It's bloody lazy to fill your studio with half a dozen flaming voices, even Wogan's at it. Now, Wogan, the most loquacious broadcaster we will ever have, even he now is up to his ears and his producer and his travel person, his bloody newsreader. He does, from time to time, address himself at you, Wogan. But, Oscar, you're totally right. You're totally right. And when Fiona said, I've got a, I've got a scarper, she said, will you be all right? I said, of course I'll be all right. She said, but what will you do? I said, I'm all right because, because, well, I said, because p people like Oscar and Chris and what have you will phone and people will email things. But the difference is, yeah, Oscar, now, I'm able to talk to you. Yeah. It's more powerful, isn't it? Yeah. I'm going to go you check out, yeah. the, in the States, I mean, Rush Limbaugh, who's the, the biggest of the yeah. talk jocks, whether you like him or you don't like yeah. him, you listen to the, to the programme or you examine the style of his show, and he does it on his own. I know. Well, he's got a producer there talking in his, on his talk back on his, in his earphones and, and people taking the calls and lining them up, but he doesn't have all the guests... Yeah. And, and a lot of the other successful talk presenters that are networked in the States and are successful in the States do that as well. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the first time I heard Rush Limbaugh, I was astonished because he did what's called, they call a monologue. He started his show off and just went, oh, I'm having Rush, Rush Limbaugh here. Uh, now, uh, what was it I wanted to uh, to, to speak uh, with you about uh, after they, uh, oh, yes, I I. I Anyway, he went off like that, and about five or six minutes in, he was still on like that. Now, I can't remember why, but I had to switch off and come back again later, so I thought that by the time I got back, he'd be well into calls or something. And I came back, and he was 22 and a half minutes, and he was still on the same thing, which is which was Newt Gingrich. <laughs> and, and the last time he... That was it. That was it. Yes, uh, uh, the last time I, uh, I spoke with... Uh, with Newt. Now, when, when was that? Um, um, and I came, so anyway, came back, and he's still 
yakking on about the last time he spoke to Newt Gring- Gingrich on the phone. And I thought, well, how can this be America's top-rated talk show? And of course it was because he was talking to me. He wasn't talking to somebody else in the studio. He was addressing me, and the way he was talking to me made me feel that it was rude of me to duck out of the room and go and do something for ten minutes because a man was talking to me. Mm -hmm. Little but important psychologies like that, Oscar, are being... People like UTV are completely ignorant of. Completely ignorant of them. They have no idea. Why aren't you in radio, Oscar? Um, well, you know, if someone's going to offer me the sort of money that they've offered to Rush Limbaugh, maybe I'd be tempted. It's, well, you know it's those... peanuts, don't you? Unless you Well, I know, this is, there's, no, there's not really any money in radio, is there, for the most part? Uh, no. Certainly not in this country, you know, unless, you, unless you get a, a Jonathan Ross or a Terry Wogan type of job. There's, those, there's one or two there that pay big, big money, but well, uh, otherwise is, it's a case there, of I couldn't yeah, take the pay cut, isn't there, it? There is money still in, at the commercial, you know... At, at the entrepreneurial level in, in radio, when commercial radio started up, I was offered uh, a, a role on the board of a radio station, and I used to pitch up at the board meetings offering thoughts and ideas about how the output and the content uh, could be you know, tweaked and augmented. Mm. Uh, and as the months turned into years, it gradually became apparent to me, and this was never discussed, but it became apparent to me that Improving the content to them meant making it cheaper without losing any of the ratings because all they were doing was sitting and waiting for it to be purchased. That was it. That was the business plan. That was the total business plan. Now, I think that that still is in the minds of most people who go buying radio stations that someday somebody's going to come along and pay three times what they, they paid for it. Mm. So I've known people swear blind that they're never going to sell out, and they do. Mm. But, there's no, but I don't think there are many radio stations that are in it to make money by creating cracking programmes and therefore getting a big audience and therefore selling lots of advertising. Mind you, you've got to have a passion for it, haven't you? It's something you've got to have a passion for, and it is an unusual business structure because it's this triangular structure which is unusual in business, what do you mean? where in a sense you're trying to attract listeners, and then the listeners, because you've got the listeners, the advertisers then come to you as your clients. So yeah. it's a bit of an unusual let's, way. Um, let's keep this going. Yeah, yeah, we've run out of time, but what we'll do, okay. Oscar, I'm very grateful for your intelligence and your contribution and also your technological skills in sorting Skype out. Um, let's keep this conversation up there and we'll do a bit more of it tomorrow when it'll be just me on my own from 10 until midnight tomorrow night. Sounds good to me. Cheers, mate. Bye. New Mr. Chance, you can't talk to us, yeah? Look, Look, hello? Look, I'm, I'm just wrapping up here. I don't want to stop the flow. I have a very there, important point to it's, um... it's over. Ah, well, well, in that case, it's not that important. But... You know, the thing you was on about about going to Christmas, uh, going heaven. to heaven, not for Christmas. Yes. You just go to heaven. Then what was the point? Did you say what was the best day of doing it? Yeah, go on then. Well, it's Tuesday tomorrow, isn't it? Yes. Your birthday the other day, wasn't it? No. All right, then. John Lennon died today. No, yesterday. <laughs> Hey? I know what you're talking about. Have you come here to die? No, I haven't come here to die. No, no, no. It's too rough, my friend Philip. So we want to decide, because we thought it was a quiz, and we could win something, that the best day, if we could choose the best day, name your calendar. Tomorrow. I mean, no, we'll finish the conversation tomorrow. We're going to heaven. No, I've got to go. I've got to... Sorry about that.